Good afternoon. I um, call to order um, and reconvene the special meeting of the Scotto Unified School District. Um, we will uh, have another roll call, starting from my far left. Sandy Kravitz. Allison Beckham. Pam Purdy. Kim Hartman. Kim Hartman's here, and Barbara Perleberg. All board members are present, and we do have a quorum. Our first item is item 6A. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. I was like knowing I was off on my list. Pledge of Allegiance, please. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, of America. the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, for all. All right. Okay. Um, so our first item is 7A, possible action item. Approval of revisions to the teacher employment agreement. President Berg, what would you like to present? Sure. We, um, Governing Board, we're going to be presenting uh, some concerns that we have in hiring processes and, and practices here in Scottsdale, but we have also uh, invited our uh, SEA to present some concerns from their perspective, and we have said that we would allow them to go first. So I believe, Romy, is it you? Okay. So you're up first. We have 15 minutes, so what I want to do before we start is want to frame uh, a little bit about how this happened. So on Tuesday, just less than 48 hours ago, we were told as teachers that there's going to be a massive change that's going to be presented to the board for a vote of approval. Um, then a few hours later, after we were told, um, we were granted the opportunity to present our case. So it's almost felt like an ensure that some of you as we were going up in front of the church to share, to plead our case, and, and depending on which time, give the better argument, and we like that type of thing. Uh, so I, I, I want to frame that because, in my opinion, when we talk about working together, that it, it just seems far far away from that. Um, so I, I, I want you to realize that at least the teachers, and I'm speaking on behalf of them currently, um, this is not an example of teachers' voices being heard. This is not an example of teachers' voices being heard. Um, putting teacher input, voice, and professional experience on a 15-minute block at the 11th hour prior to a vote that you're being asked to vote on um, is just more insulting than it is actually. Well, I, let me understand something. Yeah. So, do you want this 15 minutes, or would you prefer not to have it? Well, absolutely. I just want to frame in terms of how this 15 minutes Because the governing board, so. the governing board did not do this, Ronnie. Right? Mean, that was the decision the superintendent made, and, and I would ask you to be respectful and gracious to the governing board in your presentation. And, and I feel like I, I am, and I will, because I'm, I'm just sharing okay. background about what got into this decision right now. So, um, let's talk about a little speed. Uh, not a little speed, actually. This is a few right here. So, Susie's doing teaching right now, and she's fired up, and she's ready to go to the teacher floor and get orders of honor bulletin boards, right, because she gets kids coming in. Um, and she, Susie knows that she is, uh, she's got pretty high nice capital. She knows that there's a teacher shortage, right? Everybody drew the papers and seen the headlines. So for her, it's a matter of where do I want to go, right? So what district do I want to work for? Um, yes, money is a factor. For new teachers, though, it's like the, the idea of money may not be as, as prominent. Um, luckily for Susie, she has friends that work for, in multiple districts. So if Susie were to ask her friend, unless she has a friend that works for Scotch, and there's a reason why I'm sharing this, I will get to that point. Um, she has a friend that works for Scotch Hill. She went up to her friend that works for Scotch Hill and said, hey, I want to know about your students. Like, tell me about them. Is this a great place to be? I think Susie would be pretty fired up to come here. And if the conversation is, hey, I want to know about your classroom, your colleagues, your site, I think for the most part, Susie would be pretty fired up. When Susie says, I want to know about your district, so what process do teachers have in terms of your district? I don't know what her, her reaction is going to be, um, but um, what, what do we think our teachers would say if they were asked that question? I mean, that's, 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 um, so if our goal is to retain teachers, 
Um, we seem to somehow started making actual early decisions that drive the current users out, or discourage them from speaking up, or take away any further voice they have from being involved in our conference. Uh, so that's what you should be in mind as we go through the presentation. So one thing that I want to talk about is this false scenario that we're excited, and we're excited at the national level, at the state level, at the local level. This whole idea of, well, let's do what's best for students, but then we're doing what's best for you, and let's do what's best for teachers, but then you have to do what's best for students. Somehow those two things have become exclusive with each other, and they don't have to be. In fact, those things are more closely related to each other, whereas this is what it should be. In fact, there are districts out there that are doing it. They're supporting students, and they're supporting teachers. In fact, there are teachers out there that are supporting students by making supporting teachers their focus. Uh, teachers here seem to be viewed as sometimes a burden if we are going against a district plan or we are going against a model that has been created and, and shared with us but shared without very much notice. Um, we're sometimes viewed as we are just complainers that don't really work hard for our students. Um, and I hope that's not the case. Um, you're more than welcome to come to my house anytime you want to be after school all the way to like 2 in the morning where we're working on things for school. Uh, when most of the things we complain about are related to our students, we want really, really great curriculum. We want teachers to have time to collaborate. We want to have quality, um, impactful professional development. Like you hear what teachers want, almost every single week comes from their teachers. In fact, we want to be the best version of teachers that we can be for students. So when we hear that we do not have a voice or we are not part of the, let me back up, we are not part of the creation process. And all we're being told is we're, we're given directives. It does not motivate teachers to want to stay in a district that doesn't necessarily think about it. Right? We have a teacher shortage, we're trying to attract two proper teachers, and at the same time, our current teachers somehow actions that have been taken and need to be Um so overall, I'm going to get to the topic, but the most I get up in front of you is a very, very big one. So I, I'm sharing, please do not downplay the importance of this quote as you make a decision. This is not about transferring one. This is a much bigger story, and this is a much bigger process that says it's very, very clear about the teachers in terms of what their rights, their protections, their quality of teaching is. So let's talk about the carpenter. I will run through this quickly. Um, yesterday I sent you guys just some language, so we can get it out of the way, so you guys got that or you may have reviewed it. Um, I want to give you just some philosophy. So when I think of a department chair as a math teacher, or my department chair is the person that comes to me and we meet every single Thursday at lunch by choice and says, hey, here are the conversations going on at the principal level. Here are the conversations going on at the district level of the department chair meeting. Here's the feedback that we want to get. What do you think about this? How should this work? How will this look? And then we give that feedback back. And the next time they meet, the department chair shares that information. Right? The department chair is essentially another outlet for teachers to have a voice to share with. The process currently gives a good amount of power to principal and a good amount of power to the teachers there. So it almost seems like it's a win-win. I don't know why we're creating, why we're fixing something that's not broken. And I just want to hit on this so you guys can do for yourself too. But um, a department chair is not a compliance officer. Like I want a department chair that's going to come back to me and challenge if my thinking is wrong. And I want a department chair that can go to their principal and challenge them or challenge the curriculum specialist and say, hey, at our site, this didn't seem to work. We need to come up with a better system. That's who a department chair is. It's an actual, someone who's representing us from a leadership standpoint. So I don't know the details of the proposal, but I, I heard pieces of it where it's the site principal that handpicks the department chair. So I think to myself, being a principal, and I'm not thinking that because I'm not a principal, um, the, the system we would create if we had principal just, just pick certain people, regardless of how often the principal is, you can get some principals that say, I'm going to pick these six that will all agree with me, that will all think like me, I think it's going to be great. And, and, and in, unintentionally, quiet teachers' voice. So they kind of get put in their place um, once again. So, in terms of the department chair, the system we have works really well. In fact, we have a system that says, if your department chair is not doing their job, you as teachers in the department can start the reversal process, or if the principal doesn't think they're doing a good job, the principal in that can also start the reversal process. So there are checks and balances in this. Um, so I don't know where the department chair take away from the came from, but I think it'd be awesome to have a group of leaders around the table that can challenge each other. And just say, hey, new principal, even for a new principal. This is how we've done things at our school, the new principal says, hey, let's try this. And they go, 
great, let's bring that back to teachers. Let's get feedback. Let's work together to come up with an actual solution that everybody has bought. And that's the role that the Harvard Carriers take. And taking that power away from the teachers' voices will could essentially take that leader that I look up to that I know is advocating for me at the school that decided it is. That's the easy one, at least when I was creating this presentation. Transfer process is not so easy, right? Because when we talk about transfer process, I, I think calling it transfer process makes it uh, a little easier. This is a process that deals with people's jobs. This is a process that deals with maybe where they're going to be at, what their job looks like next year, if they have a job, depending on um, birth and transfer. So um, the philosophy, again, I sent it to you, but just I just want to read it quickly. Transfer policy is intended to honor our teachers' commitment and services to those who are the needs of the students and programs that serve these students are meant. The following transfer process is based on the premise that any movement of teaching, of teaching staff must be legal, consistent, and able to deal with unforeseen circumstances, be timely and non-discriminatory. That's great, right? I don't, I don't, I can't imagine anybody looking at this being like, no, this is a terrible philosophy. This is a joint philosophy that was created before my time, before current administration time. Uh, so here's the timeline. And I think the biggest hang up with the timeline where it's like, hey, we want to hire women as teachers. There's tons of really great teachers out there. Right? There are student teaching now, both Susie, not Will, Susie, who's student teaching now. We can have a chance to get Susie and bring her into Pasco and have her just be a phenomenal teacher. And maybe even a teacher leader to impact other teachers, right? So I, I get the part. This is not a, I, I can't see this side of the coin. I get it. This timeline starts on the 17th and ends on April 13th. Right? There's two places that I'm, I'm assuming there's a hang up there. One of them is vacancy postings. That says if there's any openings in the district, they cannot be posted externally if we currently have a teacher in Scottsdale that's unassigned. Meaning, there could be one unassigned math teacher, and we're going to need 30 openings for math. We can't post that to this experiment. That's, that's where I'm assuming is, is one of the key issues here where, where we're trying to get people in. Uh, the second one is the first time assigned teacher placement doesn't happen until April. Right? April time, student teachers are almost graduating, some of them are locked in contracts, etc. Uh, so we can go on what happens. For transfer, every year that we've done transfer, this is my fifth year where I'm like drowning in transfer. Um, we always talk about the timeline every single year. We say, let's, let's shorten up the timeline. Trust me, if we can get our teachers placed like two months earlier, I'm not for that. Completely on board. There's a process along the way, and if you're not sure what the parts of the process are and your rationale, I urge you to not be so quick to get rid of it, because parts of it honor teachers, while also honoring principal choice in this transfer process. And this is the last part where, hey, we take care of our own friends. The problem still lies in that we may have 29 openings, but we can't hire anyone because we have one unassigned teacher in that position. That's, that's really kind of the, where we get stuck. Um, I will tell you that I don't have the numbers, so I haven't had a chance to get the numbers, but as you have seen, how job fairs earlier this spring. We have had people come and say, hey, I'm interested in teaching math. It's graduated, or I'm going to do teacher. Scott sells out like a free interview, and if things look good and, and everything goes forward, they offer them contracts. So, this doesn't stop as you can see from offering people contracts externally. Their contract does not have a site. Their contract says they're going to work for Scottsdale, and the idea behind it is when we get here, if we have teachers of our own that have busted, that have worked really, really hard um, in Scottsdale, and they are owed a position somewhere where technically it's their preference, let's put them there here. But by the way, along the way, we already have teachers that have and we can just place them at a different time. It makes sense in my head because I've just been doing it for so long. Is that like the two viewers? Do you have any clarification on that? Okay. Um, so while the assessment may be this, realize we have people that have contracts. There are brand new teachers that haven't even graduated yet that have contracts and hard work with Wisconsin. I would love to look at the data to those numbers are. Like, if we have 30 math openings, do we have 10 teachers that already have contracts for math positions that we want to wear? I'd just be curious if we kind of, uh, um, what the numbers truly are. Um, and while we're racing to self-position, new position, 
Um, the lack of value that our current teachers feel has to. We, we talk to that. We'll create more of a negative reputation to the top. And we know this, right? We, we've been part of this before. That'll have a negative impact on the rate of teachers going up. More importantly, we are pushing our current teachers out. We're creating a worse teacher shortage, in a sense, by making decisions using this process. So we're still offering contracts. We want to change the timeline, which, by the way, in terms of negotiation, no one's opposed to that. We bring it up to the table just as much as that's just a matter of we want to change the timeline when we're here instead of months before. When we're going to the months before when you try to figure out what the shortage is going to be. In fact, people stood up here at the government board meeting and shared a concern about transferring staffing and it was kind of disregarded. And this is now caught up with other questions. So here's something about transfer. Um, it is not an evaluation system. That is at the transfer committee, we say, this is not how we get bad teachers out, quote unquote bad. There's a process for that, and that makes your one important. Um, it's objectively are equitable, I'm, I'm not going to, I think any of you have even said this, too. you may have, you may have seen this um, earlier, so. So here's what student deposit is. Um, essentially, it's a little remaining states that our teachers, that our teachers have a voice. Um, a faith in any committee that's going to happen. So for me personally, when I was told this, I was just more upset that there are literally tens of hours that I was as my kids because I was at the transfer committee, which all that work pretty much got thrown out the window. I can only imagine what other teachers feel who volunteer and give up their time and that are kind of put in their place in terms of their voice. Um, for the Landry teacher turnover, it faces an SUSD issue created for one school. So I think that some of this intent is coming from the core out of success initiative where we don't have enough positions to fill those spots. So we're essentially going to disrupt the other schools in terms of training for just because of this one. Uh, and during training for you guys first brought it up, the training for community coaches. Uh, teachers who attended the core out of success initiative meetings in the morning brought it up, but there really weren't answers. And I'm sharing this because I'm trying to emphasize this point of why didn't the conversation happen right then and there with teacher leaders that said, hey, this might happen. Right? Do you foresee anything coming up in the future that might throw a wrench in our plans that we need to look at prior instead of doing it when we're right in the middle of the chamber? If it's a core out issue, let's address it. Maybe it's worth focusing on just that specifically to figure that out. But overall, this process in the history has run very successfully. It honors our current teachers, provides actual consistency in community from year to year. By the way, there are certainly examples of a transfer process having nightmare issues. Like everything else, there are always these examples. But I assure you, in my five years, those random scary examples of transfer have been anomalies. They are not enough. So please keep that in mind uh, as we go through this. Um, and if we're concerned about filling spots as best candidates as soon as possible, we should also be concerned about the decisions we make and how they impact current teachers that are already in the Um By the way, I don't know, and you don't need to answer this, but just ask yourself, when was the first time you heard about this proposal? When was the first time was it shared to the board? Because he and Dick did not hear about it, transfer committee did not hear about it, and no one really heard about it in any sort of detail until the That is not how that is not how we should do business. Me coming up here to pretend like Dave doesn't show us working together. In fact, it shows us the opposite. Anybody ever seen House, the doctor? House? Okay, so let me, it's just an hour show, I'm almost done. It's an hour show, and they spend the first 40 minutes treating this patient. So it's like a space in the hospital. And they treat the patient, and then the patient gets worse. And then they treat them for this, and they get worse. And they treat them for this, and they get worse. And 40 minutes into it, almost every single show is maybe that day. I know I watched some of this. But after 40 minutes, you go, we were treating the symptoms. We were treating the actual diagnosis. We are putting band-aids on these things along the way. That's what this felt like as I was hearing this. Is me standing up here, I'm talking about transfer and department here. But we will be up here again and again, over and over, because we seem to be dealing with the symptoms of how things are done versus the actual diagnosis. Uh, so I, to the point, uh, the importance of this vote, like, sounds like, like, like gut check, because I, I can't imagine where you are right now, because I feel like you have to vote one way partially because that shows support for districts and then you're like there's teacher like it's it, being a board member I can't imagine how like torn you are about this like your stuff changes depending on who you talk to. Uh, I I do want to let you know that 
based on how you vote, will be a very, very crystal clear message to teachers um, about where, about the part you play in the process, about whether we are valued as professional voices, and about whether, I guess, whether we're, we're just told that that in our, our place, um, and can kind of go do your job and don't, don't rub on each other. Um, I brought the DA because this is not growing. This is not Dr. Rizzo. This is not Dr. Sid, right? This is decades upon decades of teachers and board members and district administrators and site administrators putting together a document that makes sense. Putting together a document that says, hey, how do we make sure we value people? How do we make sure we put protections in place because you're doing what's best for students? Earlier, teachers be like, I'm going to what's for students today, and they walk into the rec classroom. You don't have to say that out loud. You just go in and do what's best for students. But this thing is what is, is what makes us feel like we have enough work where I can go in and comfortably spend time on what I need to spend time on. So while you're going to hear the other version of this and their rationale behind the changes, I urge you to really consider what the severity and the impact of your vote is going to be. Thank you for giving me the time. I appreciate it. If I came off through any part of the way, I hope you know me well enough that it's not my time. Thank you. Kim, are you hearing all right? Yes, I can hear fine. Thank you. Thank you. Every day I work with staff, so I learn something new about the Every day I am amazed at the really good to have lost the focus of the market and the time that we are doing the game. It can change drastically in the last 10 years. The economy has gone through an immense downturn. We are finally beginning to rebound. But what happened is during those downturns in Arizona, We've lost thousands of teachers. The point is that the state of Arizona has lost and insured 2,000 teachers in South Dakota. The market is competitive. I traveled uh, as a superintendent, as a superintendent of human resources, to places like old Minnesota, trying to sell the sunshine of Arizona to the young people who come here. To Michigan, I traveled to South Dakota and North Dakota. I traveled to New York looking for diversity in teachers. So I hired across our nation. And it's very hard to get folks to come to Arizona because of our teacher pay. And then the word on the street that our state doesn't necessarily respect education. Look at some of the odds that we face in Arizona. Now, that's what we're very fortunate. That's what's been able to attract people. And I think it's really important to note that. Uh, we have had openings every year with the United States field. So there are districts across the state that have surpassed that list. We have districts that, that pay more. We have districts that have a different culture and environments. We have districts that are hiring teachers in November and December. They get out very early and, and make the hire. So one of the points that uh, Ronnie made is, well, that's we had a fair in the hiring of teachers. We, I believe we hired nine, nine teachers. Last year we had multiple openings. I'm going to go through some statistics that might help some of this conversation. There are challenges in hiring teachers, not just in Scottsdale, in the state of Arizona and in our nation. But we are responsible for Scottsdale, and we are responsible for the systems that we have here. So, Ronnie said there was a timeline, but there is a timeline of conversation that occurs. And the Cornell succession issue is just a piece of it. But in reality, um, on February 24th, there was an email from the co-chair Roney to the co-chair uh, Ms. Doyle in HR that said, hey, look, there's going to be a placement of the inside staff before you hire outside. 
what had happened is um, we had had 11 teachers that had opted out of the Coronado initiative, and we posted the position. We wanted to see if we could attract. Now, we were still in the interview process, and I'm going to go through that here in a moment. So uh, when we got that email, and that email was brought to me, I said, explain to me what the issue here is. Why would we not want to go out and hire the very best teachers today? Why are we not in the job of hiring the best teachers today? Our neighbors are hiring the best teachers. Why are we not doing it? That's the system I began to look at. And say, We've had some problems with it. Now, as an outsider coming into Scottsdale, it raised a lot of concerns. So I went to the Governing Board and had an executive discussion, executive session with the camp and stuff. Um, but then we had spring break. And then this is the week after spring break. Here we are. And we had a meeting this week with the FDA president. We had some phone conversations. We said, hey, look, come to the Governing Board and present. That was, that was a decision I made because of the time frame of spring break. We didn't have time for a meeting, for a meeting but hey, come and voice your opinion. And um, I thought that was being gracious, but you'll have to define that in the future. So what happened with the success initiative? Well, let, let me take this back in time a little bit to Coronado. We had three teachers to retire, two have resigned, um, unassigned 14 teachers, and we had 54 interviews. Uh, 20 of them did not make it to the interview process, but we hired 34 teachers. We're excited about that. And these are people, not FTE. Well, what also is normal is that it's pretty normal in a high school to have three retirees. It's pretty normal in a high school to have two resignations. Um, that's the normal process. So the unnormal process was the bottom half, the fact that everybody was unassigned. And we did go around the meeting and have more meetings. And we did say every person who's unassigned will have a job in Festa. And we're holding true to that. Every unassigned person in Scottsdale will have a job. Now, the rumor recently said that I'm going to remove other teachers to create jobs for the Cornell teachers, and that's not true. That's a bold faced lie. Because they don't need to. There will be plenty of jobs, but as you will see, it's going to take time to get there. So here's the old thing at um, Cornell right now. There are 26.2 FTEs available. We have counseling no people from a retirement. 37 applicants that are looking at that job from outside the district because we posted. I can't hire them. We have a fee position as a retirement. We have an instructor and parole campaign that we go through an interview process with. We have 5.6 English teachers. We have 6 math teachers. Why should we hire 12 math teachers in this district? Math is hard to fill. We have fragments of positions. Now, this is a high school staff, which means that it also was affected by the fact that kids didn't sign up for some classes. So some of those unassigned are unassigned because nobody signed up for the classes they offered. So they became what's called a circle. That happens during this time of year as well. In the initiative, we put out the jobs of the 14 people who said, I don't, I'm not assigning my position and going somewhere else in the district. We spoke to those positions, and here's what happened. The counseling position for the environment, 37 applicants. We ought to be interviewing 37 applicants to find an accountant. CTE, they're doing computer science. Seven applicants so far. That's going to be hard to build. We ought to be interviewing 19 English teachers, two math people. We're going to have a hard time building that. Science, 12. Social studies, 36. Special ed, 12. But I've got a surplus of special ed. Not as concerned as you. So what happens? Um, we, we have volunteer and unassigned. We have involuntary and unassigned. I would call the Coronado unassigned what I would call in, involuntary. So in other words, if they didn't ask to be unassigned, they got in a model that caused them to be unassigned. Then there's a circle. In high school, a circle is, hey, I, I have a, a class that I teach that no one signed up for. No one wants to take my computer science class, and all of a sudden, I get surplus that fragment of my class. Out of those 74 teachers in the district at bars, you notice that only, only 27 now in Coronado High School. There are 27 SUSD teachers at bars who are asked to be unassigned. That's 64.6 FTE unassigned to 74 people. So there's some pregnant jobs there. We have 74.3 vacancies in the district right now today. We guarantee a position in SUSD, but when you, when you become unassigned, you give up your contracted your position. Now comes a very complex puzzle, matching up certifications to OB. That's a little more complicated. 
Because right now, over 45 of the reservation and retirements we have, nine are elementary, 10 are K-8, four are going to school, 10 are high school, 12 are special ed. So we don't have 26 positions in high school to automatically place one up. So when you say no hiring outside the district so every teacher in the district has a position, it raised a red flag. Now, historically, 198 teachers were hired in 2015-16. 2016-17, 183 teachers. There's a question mark for next year how many we will hire. We know for sure we have 45, but there's a process that takes place. The first will answer is April 13th. Where, where do these come from? There's four plus teachers and assigned teachers. All can be created by retirement, resignation, growth from leveling, in other words, I have a large fourth grade class that moves into fifth grade, causing a need, causing a decrease in fourth grade, causing a surplus in one area and growth in another area. Students work for us in another way that we have extra staffing. That's on the 13th. That's the first set of holes. There's another set of holes. April 19th, if contracting goes according to your the time frame. We still have continued unsigned teachers. So we start placing teachers in jobs that we have. But we have some that are still out of time because we don't have a perfect match. We might have more elementary openings and more secondary people needing to sign up. We continue to see all these created by retirement, resignations, and non-signed contracts. That's a normal process in the industry. Why is the 19 by the contract? If the governing board approves the 2017-18 compensation package next board meeting, if the board did that, if they were satisfied with the meeting for process of security that this is the compensation that we're going to offer. And HR then immediately began their process of thinking a couple of days to do that. They would then send out contracts that would be received in the 20th. The law requires 15 business days for a teacher to turn that contract back in. So we can't assume anything until the 19th. That creates the second opening of jobs. Then on those openings, we go back to the building level principles. So for instance, if I was a calculus teacher, but I have another teacher that might want to teach calculus, I might assign a calculus and open up an algebra class. So there's a leveling of the curve. Or I might ask my fifth grade teacher, would you like to take my fourth grade opening, and then I host the fifth grade class. So there's a process that happens internally during that time. Then you post externally on the 24th to the 28th, if you want to give at least five days as a standard HR process. Which means that we would take the screen and begin interviewing May 1st to June 1st. And everybody knows after June 1, the very best of teachers have gone. And remember I said that our competition is already beginning to hire. They began hiring in November while the student teachers teach the graduate and graduate student teachers. They began hiring by hitting those three markers. But heavy hiring occurs in January and February as we go through the process of job fairs across our nation. And we do what I call coaching. We call the very best teachers that we know of in this case, and we begin to ask them to come up with You'll see teachers of the year, like our own Chris Marsh, who on our own Facebook shares, she's going to pay for it. Because other districts want the very best. The teacher of the year has been out speaking, they're going to recruit her. And lucky for K Street, they grab one of our best. So we begin to direct, but we don't post that position because they don't have a non signed contract or a resignation. I won't know that until the 19th. I know it because of Facebook, but I really won't know it until the paperwork comes through in the HR process. Then we began to hire. Well, what happens is we go back to all these people who apply at Coronado, <coughs> and now in May, I see if they're still available. But I gambled March and April that they may have gotten a job somewhere else. So that candidate pool will dwindle and dwindle and dwindle, and we won't know what we have. Now, we will continue to guarantee these 74 teachers contracts and placements, but it takes time for the placement and the shuffling to occur because all of these other processes have to happen. So while we're going through the I didn't turn in the contract, my husband got a job in California, and I'm choosing to go. Those openings allow the opening for the unassigned folks to take position. We don't bump or whip people who are under contract with us to find someone else a position. In the end, as we said in all those morning meetings, 
in the end, if they don't have a job, we'll put them in a pool of substitute at their regular pay. And we did that last year for PE. At the time the school year started, every PE person was placed in a job, and we didn't have a pool of substitute. But that gives us a full process because there is a third time that we get open, and it's called summer. And we get every summer unexpected resignations from us. I decided to stay home with my children. My husband has been transferred. I, I, I have to go take care of my parents. I've got a serious illness. And we have multiple obese that occur in the class. And every district in the state has that. And then we have growth and decline. So all of a sudden, and Sagi doesn't this year had a big second grade, and I had to go find a second grade teacher to get to school, of which he'll do. But that happens under growth and decline. We have unexpected A levels that come in, and people who choose to come back, and people who choose to leave. So that's the third time. By the time all of that is done, you settle with us, and everybody has a job. But if there's any system in place that holds you up from hiring during that, you're not on the market with the neighbors. You're not on that market for Arizona. You're sitting back believing that because we're stuck still, in June, people will still fund them. In May, there will be a plus of teachers. But specifically, I don't believe that Arizona has a plus of teachers. So I have some concerns with the superintendent as the lead administrator who's responsible for staffing all of our students that we have a system that's going down. I appreciate that I heard both well from Julie and then here from Ronnie that they're willing to change that system. But how many meetings do we need to have to fix the problem and how many weeks are we going to wait to hire before we get out there and interview those folks for the jobs that we have? And I'm going to tell you, teachers don't like it. When we handle a contract at a fair and say, boy, we'd like you to join the MTSD, I can't tell you what school or what grade. But gee, thanks for doing that. You're a great elementary teacher. When they can go to Chandler, Chandler says, You agree to be a third grade teacher, and we're giving you a third grade, and by the way, your third grade is going to be at this elementary school. And they look at that offer and they go, That's still Chandler. I'm going to Chandler. I know who I'm going to teach, and the grade level I'm going to teach, and I know the principal I'm going to work for because leadership doesn't matter. So we've created a system, in my opinion, that has caused us some of our own problems. So I'm going to ask Dr. Sitton to talk about why we believe the CEA has some issues in it that is causing us some frustration. Now, again, I'm going to emphasize that she hands us out. This came to my attention February 24th from an email from Ronnie. I didn't realize the depth of the cost of the stock bill and its impact is not chronology. It's a special SUSD issue of getting the very best features for our students. So, let's talk through the problems that we see in history. Okay, so I gave out uh, a red line taking a look at the staffing timeline. So, I'm going to go through the staffing timeline as well as the transfer language that we have. And the focus that we've worked on is really only make changes that are impacted timing in the process. How do we speed up the process? So you'll notice on the staffing timeline, the entire first page was through March, but that entire process is already occurred, no changes to it. We have our RIF, we don't believe we have a RIF at all, that doesn't change. What really starts to slow us up is we make that we take the vacancy postings and post them beginning tomorrow until May, in, all the way till May 25th, they keep getting posted. So, and we can't do anything through the transfer process. So the, the transfer process goes until April 7th. So everything is posted until that transfer process and the first unassigned on April 13th. So those are the two timelines. So what I am recommending here and Cabinet is recommending is that we go ahead and do the teacher transfer process, that we put out the sheet of where all the vacancies are. We've already sent to the teachers to start collecting their preferences for anyone who's unassigned, but we're not going to leave that transfer process open. That come March 20th, that principal can actually start having conversations with internal and external candidates around what that would look like. So our current employees, 
are able to go ahead and contact principals just like they've always done. They can have a conversation if they want to be considered for a transfer. We're just not going to leave it open for that long window. And then go to first unassigned placement April 13th. So it's really just taking that time off. We'll do the transfer process. It's opening up on this Monday. Now, on the unassigned, because that process, you have to match up when you see the 74 vacancies and the 64, we know that we don't have all the secondary openings that we need. So some are going to have to wait, and maybe June, it may be May, it may be July, before those openings end up coming occurring. So on the first unassigned placement, what the recommendation is that we are actually going to hold a meeting, and we have a date of next week, the 22nd. So anything we decide on today, we'll make sure it's communicated out to teachers right away so that we hold the meeting like we've always held the meeting. And we'll inform them of what the process is going to look like for anyone who's on that unassigned list. We collect the preference sheet, just like we've always collected the preference sheet. And that we will then start to match. I am recommending, though, that it is the president of SBA with myself, that we don't take the transfer committee because they're uh, classroom teachers and because it takes more time to do that Julie and I would be able to sit down and work the process. And this way, it's not one co-chair over the other co-chair doing it. We'll take both co-chairs out of it. And then the SA president and myself will actually go on the process that we can start immediately next week, placing those that are on the unassigned list instead of waiting until April 13th. So there's a few strikethroughs that happen in that unassigned placement thing. And then I would just work with the president of SBA to make the placement. So it's not, there's minimal changes taking a look at anything that we can do to speed up the hiring, get our own teachers, honoring our own teachers so that when they actually get their contract, they know what their placement is already, that they're not waiting for they're able to know their placement either. So we will begin that work next week. So I you to entertain some questions on this piece, and then we'll talk about the partners here. But the, the reality is what we want to do is assign our own teachers as rapidly as possible. Know that we can't assign everybody until the whole shifting of people deciding whether they want the contract. And I don't think teachers are going to make a decision about the contract until you tell them they're going to pay. And that's another issue. Because teachers want to know, am I getting a raise? Am I getting my step? Am I getting my education? And what's my contract uh, date look like? And so that's decided. That process slows down the opening and it slows down the unassigning. So, so those issues are hanging out there too. But I, I got to say, as soon as we can start assigning teachers, we don't want them. As soon as we can start interviewing outside candidates, we can start interviewing. And again, historically, we didn't have lots of jobs available. I don't, I don't believe that those 26 teachers in Coronado won't have a job. I sincerely believe that we will have plenty of positions for them given the statistics of the last two years. Uh, but I want to say one more time for the record. We are not risking any teachers at all. None. And we are not asking a teacher to vacate a spot so that a more seasoned teacher can step into their role. And that rumor has been out there, and that fear factor is not what we're doing. All we're asking to do is assign our teachers as directly as possible and go out and hire the very best teachers for our students as quickly as we can so that we can get that teaching job done. And as contract, as quickly as we can, so our teachers are not coached by the neighbors. I don't like losing our teachers to the neighbors. Uh, that's certainly the problem. I don't know if the board has questions thus far about what Dr. Fisher. Board members, uh, board member Hartman. Um, I'm I I will have comments to towards the end. Okay. okay. All right. All right. And then so the next thing our conclusion is council needs to make hard and best authority for students and teachers. And hesitation and waiting is not in the best of that, That's our, our bottom conclusion. Um, department chair. First of all, department chair is an archaic term. Department chair um, were a system that was put in place when there were large budgets of which to administer and textbooks to check in and out. And uh, sometimes some districts actually use department chairs to uh, hold teachers accountable and to visit classrooms and do evaluations. But today, most teachers have moved to things called instructional leadership teams. It's groups of teachers who are leaders on the campus to help lead professional development, to support new teachers, to uh, uh, be the master teachers, the model classroom, uh, 
And as you look at initiatives, uh, that leadership is an extension of the leadership of the visionary of the campus, and the head leadership on the campus is the principal. The principal is the lead instructional teacher of the campus. And those are the teachers that we uh, want to hire, principals who are teachers. And what we want them to do is pick their team. Now, I heard uh, our, our friends say, well, the principals don't have good job. They'll pick the people they like. The principals might pick people that they like. And you might have something that is kind of in their mind. So maybe I missed her too. But the reality is, we hire a principal to lead a campus. We hire them as the visionary of the campus, as the instructional leader of the campus. And they should put together and assemble a team to lead teachers. And it shouldn't be the same person 10 years in a row. It ought to change up a little bit. And we ought to grow teacher leaders. We ought to give teachers opportunities to serve in leadership. But we shouldn't lose a system that's voted on by, by the department. I, I haven't seen a system like that in years where the team both the person to serve the leader. But the leadership team serves all the teachers in the school under the guidance of the principal working together to move the instruction forward. So as we look forward to the future, I believe it should be the principal, the leader of the campus to pick the team. If you have the CEO coming in and saying, I'm not going to pick the team that's going to move this organization forward in order to be profitable. Instead, I'm going to just let the consumer send me somebody to be my team. And I can't imagine using that kind of concept. The consumer is important. The single is important and valuable. But the reality is, the person who's responsible in the day, the person I'm going to hold accountable, the person I'm going to fire if the campus doesn't make progress, is the principal. But I should give the principal every tool and flexibility to be successful in their culture. And I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that if they don't take the leadership team from that campus to help them lead. Because today you cannot lead in isolation. Instructional leaders must rely on teacher leadership in order to move these schools forward to the best for our students, to provide the professional development. That instructional leadership team helps that principal determine the PD that that campus needs. The department chairs traditionally have been checking in the books, checking out the books, overseeing the budget, helping with the orders. Uh, the system has management thing. We're going to do what Our error is about instruction, it's about leadership. And we often read uh, research about teacher leaders. This is an opportunity for teacher leaders. Some campuses, you might have two great teacher leaders in the same department that are going to serve on that social leadership team. It may not be that I have one from math and one from science and one from English and one from social studies. I might have two outstanding teachers in the English department that need to be instructional leaders for our whole campus. So it's not tied to departmentalization like it used to be. So as we go forward, if we have something in our TA that prevents our principal from being that great instructional leader and then me holding them accountable for expectations of instructional leadership, I think we ought to consider whether or not it belongs there. Um, these are just two of the things that we want to talk about. We think more important as we go into next year. Uh, we want to spend more time in meeting and confer going through all of the language of a, when we say, decades and decades of work from administrators to teachers over the decades and decades. Well, it's a 150 year old model that I have a long time too, but I don't think the 150 year old model of instruction of sit and did is the progress of today. So we could always look at our systems to see if they're working for today's market. Today's market is not to wait for May to hire teachers. Today's market, we should consider whether or not a department chair is active or not. And let me just say this last piece. We have a high school. In my vision, I'd like to see us create a system that allows for agenda for the elementary and the middle level and the high school to have instructional leadership and teacher leaders on all those campuses. And they don't have that today. We only pay the high school people. But I think we ought to bring in middle school teachers as instructional leaders and elementary folks and pay them all to be instructional leaders and give them an opportunity for teacher leadership. So as we take this apart, we're also talking about rebuilding it to touch every campus in teacher leadership. I really
that's that's where I'm at with that, and and we we're not trying to lose teachers. We're trying to attract and retain, but we need to do it more rapidly if we're going to compete with Chandler and Mesa and Curtis Valley, the Deer Valley, and Peoria, and Hayes Creek, who are taking up with teachers. Any questions to ask? Board Member Kirby. Um, thank you, Dr. Birdwell. The word that on the department chairs that was um, that Roni used was handpick department yeah. chairs, and I heard you say through your presentation multiple times, pick. So, is there an interview process that teachers who are interested in being this instructional leader will be able to to put in for? And, and put their name in the hat to be considered, or is it a pick? No, I think what we need to do is let's say, get the principal together and talk about what, and I don't want to do it with them, so I'm happy to do it with them, um, but to get together and say, here's what instructional leaders, teacher leadership looks like, so that the person applying for it understands what it is, right. because it's not about counting books and taking in budgets and, and overseeing that. Because if we talk about explaining this at the elementary, the middle, and the high school, we want to clearly define what an instructional leader does. That you you know that you're going to coach new teachers. That you're going to allow people to come into your classroom and see you as a master teacher. That you're going to help drive the professional development on the campus. So, so putting together that description for our staff and working with our teachers on that description um, is really important. And then allowing the principal to call in people who are interested and take them through an interview process and talk about those correlates on that description and why they feel they're ready to do that. Uh, I think it's critical to have that. So, uh, yeah, we need a description of it, and then we need a, uh, an opportunity to come in and interview with the principal, and then the decisions are made. Thank you. Board Member Beckham. Um, I'm going to stick with the department chair in just a minute. Um, when does the principal actually make annual decision? June? Yeah, my experience, I'm not going to talk for Scottsdale, um, and maybe we have a high school principal here that can talk to us, and maybe Mitch can talk to us, but my experience has been that it is an annual process, that during staffing, after I finish my staffing process and I know who I have on staff, then in May, or sometimes if there's been a large turnover, it's after they come back, <coughs> there's a process that you go through. But you usually like to determine it in May so that they know coming into the next fiscal year that they're going to be a part of that because there are addendums tied to it, and teachers want to know if that's going to be an addendum. And there are individuals who choose not to do it because they coach and there are other expectations that they have and they don't have the time to dedicate to it. Because it is another meeting, and it's, it's typically going to be a, a, you know, a bi-weekly meeting. It requires them to do and lead professional development. So, um, yeah, there's some time tied to it. So then I ask Mitch. what have been the practice? Um, the high school principals, it should be done annually under the DEA. Uh, there's options in how that, that department chair can be chosen in terms of principals mm -hmm. that have choice to the department, or departments that have choice to the principal, and then uh, the new department chair is selected. So, is it a principal to choose, I believe there's three options, the principal chooses which option? They can choose the department and come to a decision on how that and then typically in uh, the end of the year, or oh, April before the action of their whole staffing. If you don't know your staffing in April, right? So for clarity, do they meet with all departments at the high school to make the determination by department and they each? They meet with each individual department. So 14, 14 to 15 meetings, 14 to 15 different departments? Well, we need to be academic areas. Uh, I don't know if we hit that number, but uh, we had to you make tonight department heads for him. Okay. All right, and it's done starting in April before you actually know who all your teachers are going to be. Because I've just I've learned that we do not have contracts up to everybody until in uh, May. So that's correct. So they have to check before they know who's going to be working for them. Yeah, the third department that's in place. So I, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty. Everybody has a contract, and their contract is good through the last day of school in May, right? 
July and June, technically. July and June, and technically. So you could be meeting with the current, you could be meeting with the existing department that may not be the department here. Is that possible? Well, is that what you're telling me? Well, that's a possibility in case someone's out the bird will point it out. And typically you have a couple of reputations of few retirements, so you don't have a large enough people on campus this year. So for the most part, the vast majority of the department remains in place. But yes, there would be some turnover within that. Okay, thank you. So another question then for Pam. You gave us uh, what you wanted to do in the PEA for the transfer. Do you have the same thing for the department chair? For the department chair, it is taking away the language. So, so right now, we set in press. That's that. Yes, Trump. Because the three processes in there, the department nominates candidates two or three the principal select. The principal nominates two or three candidates the department select. Or anyone who's on the qualified list of department So there is a piece in there that does not put this in the control of what the leader on the campus is. So it would be spending entirely. So you can send the language here, but then you're going to pick some language up somewhere else so that the principal will be able to pick department chairs by. Well, I'm the following. I, I would ask your bird well, there's going to be a conversation around if you call this department chair. It might not be that. You're sure that it might be two math teachers are credible and they're on the leadership team. So it may be that it's a design of looking at, I know she's already working on the high school principal, looking at that leadership team you're building, not the department chair. So you're really looking at two, two very different things when we look at department chairs and we look at transfers. Oh, yeah, they're, right they're, they're two so, different. Two different so we are going to be voting on them separately. Then because of that, yeah, you, that you could make two that would be more important that we do that then. Um, what I also heard is that this is a annual agreement, correct? The CEA <coughs> and it's every year you come together and you uh, the board approves this agreement for the following year. Is that a correct statement? So is it this agreement that is stop May 30th of every year? Was it June 1? Or when is that agreement up? It would be the end of June. You start brand new July 1. Okay, so June every year. Okay. So Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong. When you contract, a, uh, the contract by definition is the agreement between an employee and a governing board. And the contract goes July 1 through June 30th. <coughs> so the agreement parallels that as an extension of the contract. Right, there's to some extent. You have your contract and you have the PEA agreement. So, tell me if this is the correct statement. You're looking at changing language in here which would be temporary and the suspension would be temporary to through June 30th of 2017. With a rewrite, the rewrite you do anyway, because you do that every year, it would be thought that these are two areas need to be rewritten. Right. Which we would ask them to include in instructional leadership elementary and middle school opportunities for teacher leaders versus just secondary. Right. And there could be other things in the transfer area that could be completely new also, given the new environment that we're in. One of the questions that came up from reading was the teachers that they did not understand when this, I think the term suspension was used in both instances, how long that would be for. So there is an answer out there. This is the term of this particular contract, but that contract is either rewritten or reading or approved by the board every year. It comes back to the board in this year. So we would never want to act in opposition of a TDA. But once the board has approved one, we want to follow it to the best of our ability. We have a market of hiring that has caused a huge constraint in the educational field. If you get out and get on the market, the only way to do that without breaking an agreement is to suspend the agreement. And then take the time to rewrite it in an appropriate manner going forward with the new market in mind. So you're exactly right. This is only taking it through June 30th. 
Now, means infer is a body that's in place that would continue to address these issues and come back with language better to address this as we go forward. And then we would go through that, that piece. Um, there will be other pieces in the meets and for process that we will bring forward as well at that time for next year's agreement. But what we're trying to do is simply hire more teachers in a more rapid method and create a broader teacher leadership opportunity in our district that um, through a process of selection by the principal through an interview. So, yeah. So I would like to address something that was brought up by um, Ronnie, um, is that because it is temporary, I, I would hope that it, 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 uh, what is being requested or proposed is temporary, that, is that that message that you keep saying that you're getting that the teachers aren't valued, I'm having difficulty with that. So I don't see this as a philosophical difference in not valuing your teachers by changing some of the language in this agreement. Because this agreement is something that is, in essence, even if it takes exactly the same year every year, because there's that opportunity <coughs> to make changes as education changes, as the environment changes, and competitiveness of um, school, school students. And I would think that that would be if the FDA would only have to be that way as So I hope, at least for me, that you are not feeling not valued by changes that you made. Okay. Board Member Kirby? Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a technical procedural question. For, uh, on the transfer language, you gave us essentially a red line version. Um, is that, are you, are you, recom is staff recommending that we approve the red line version as opposed to, and, the, and when I hear suspend, I think just, it, redline the whole thing, as opposed to what's been given to us, which is redlining portions of it. And um, I'll let you answer that first, and I'm going to have to follow up in this opinion. Um, it is an option for the board. I wanted to give you that option to say you can either suspend the language that's in there, and then know that we're still going to honor this is the process we're going to do. And I don't know if Michelle Marshall has a preference in doing this, but it makes a difference on from that standpoint. But I wanted you to clearly understand that if we're suspending the language, what does that really mean? Here's what's going to impact within our timeline. Uh, practically. Yes. Okay. So my follow-up question then is if we choose to just, just um, approve the red line and not the full suspension of it, are we, are we confident that the TEA document as a whole, will um, flow, work <coughs> with us just redlining a piece here and a piece there and a piece there as opposed to just, let's just suspend the whole thing? So, that is, am I, a little piece I think that Michelle has written in on the agenda, the recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, do you have a I'm not sure how much I gave you, but I'll, I'll answer and then find out where you are and then you can have that team. Um, board member Kirby, great question. Um, when I was asked about this, I looked at what is what is the best way to accomplish what uh, administration was looking to do um, to be able to um, free up um, the ability to hire teachers in the most efficient way and the best interest of the um, So my initial uh, recommendation was to send the entire section um, so that we did not inadvertently miss something in the detail. Um, we discuss later redlining as a backup position <coughs> should support how the discussion decides we don't want to go whole hog, we want it to be a little bit more uh, narrow 
in uh, doing that. But my recommendation to allow administration um, the most flexibility to do what they want to do than the entire time. If I might add a piece to that. The reason that a red line, if I can be so bold to say, one of my discoveries with Scottsdale is that there seems to be a huge culture of mistrust. One of which that I have I have um, been shocked with, but if we suspended the whole thing, it appears that the teachers distrust that we're going to place the on the sign. And I'm concerned about that. Because we are going to place them. We're going to follow as much of this as we possibly can. What we want to do is get out on the market and try to get some people to come to Scottsdale. But I don't believe that they trust me. I don't believe that there's a good enough culture of trust that if I said, we're going to place every unassigned teacher between now and, and June, they don't trust me. I come into a culture that automatically distrusts the superintendent. And I'm saddened by that, but it is a reality. So um, to make sure that the language doesn't conflict in other places, if you suspend the whole piece, we move forward and hopefully, because we walk our talk, They'll learn that when we say we're going to do something, we do it, and we build that faith as we go forward. If we just do the red line, does it soften the piece to say, we are honoring pieces of this, we're just trying to get out and hire. Um, so we try to do a, a softer, to try to deal with that culture of distrust. It, it wasn't a matter whether one was better than the other. It was, we live in a culture of distrust in Scottsdale, and trying to address it the best I can and say, we need to hire teachers. I, I don't... I'm not going to break this, and we're not going to break contract, and we're going to place unassigned teachers, and we're going to use the processes that exist to do that. We just don't want to. We don't want to miss the outside candidates at the same time. And the best. So what's the best option there? There isn't a good option for the superintendent either way. There's been been rumors out in the teachers field of distrust. Well, I inherited that. I'm sorry that it exists, uh, but the reality is we want to try to find a compromise to honor. So the red line was a compromise to honor. I don't know that it's going to solve the distrust. I think they're still going to distrust me. It just is the nature of stuff. If, if I may, I'm going to have a little bit of um, The other thing that you can do, if you decide to do that, is suspend both sections. And with the understanding that the administration will follow the process that's been described by uh, Dr. Rosal and Dr. Sitton. Um, and I believe uh, part of what Dr. Sitton's document uh, included something that you could look at your free today, if I'm not mistaken. That second timeline is modified. So you could specifically adopt that timeline if that helped uh, achieve the goal that I'm talking about. Yeah, I do want to be clear that I did not go through the entire PDA. So there are references other places mm. that it's a six book, as Romy showed us, and lots of pages. So I have not scoured the entire thing beyond really working on the trend in a second. Well, remember, Kirby. So um, that's important to know because that, that's a very good heads up. Thank you. Um, but we, this, these documents are now public documents. So if we chose to suspend the entire section, these documents can be given to the public so they know what the intent is. Absolutely. Right? Correct. Board Member Kravitz. I'll try and be diplomatic and not diplomatic. I don't think any of this should be interpreted as disrespectful. You may feel disrespectful, but I can assure you, I couldn't do your job. I would have to have a roll of duct tape and send the tape down to the president of the year on Saturday for the I have a lot of respect for teachers and I'm sure the city has a lot of respect for teachers as well. And I know a lot of parents do as well. I would like to uh, thank you all for your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Well, I would like to um, comment on the part of the kids and just some feedback from a parent's perspective. When a parent hears the part of the chair, they're thinking academic leader. They're thinking somebody that the parent has a question or concern, they can go to that part of the and discuss it. I just so want Several parents from several different schools, they don't need to be paying attention to the opinion that it was a broad stroke or whatever it is. But their parents that have spoken with department chairs several years ago that are still waiting for a response. 
And that's not right. I, I, Brody, from your, I, I'm not saying it's everywhere from your um, presentation, it seems like there's concern about favoritism um, in terms of who will principal pick and they're going to pick their friends. I don't feel like we have that now because we have department chairs year in and year out. Some are great, some, some, some maybe not so good. I, I don't know. I can't speak for everyone in the district, but I, I think there needs to be some sort of change, and we are entrusting our principals to be academic leaders. And, and I like your your comments, Dr. Birdwell, about um, a leadership team. And there's a frustration there that. You know, I, I, I'll try and wrap it up that when you say department chair, actually, I think going to a, you know, maybe the semantic changing titles, I hope it's more than that, that it really is a leadership team, and, and I hope it will be an opportunity for all teachers. Perhaps yeah. there's teachers that want to be department chairs, and, and they are, because year in and year out, it's the same department chair. I, I don't know. These are just some frustrations that I'm hearing in the community, and I, I thought it was important to hear. Board Member Hartman, did you have any questions or comments? Um, I, yes, I do. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have uh, actually two questions on the contract timeline and then one question on the department chair um, topic. Um, with respect to the um, contract timeline, the first question is, um, assuming that we uh, make a, have a vote on our board meeting next week, which is the uh, 21st or 22nd, um, and then the district is in a position to actually put the contracts out to the teachers, I think we're assuming that those go out on the 28th, and I'm wondering if um, there's any possibility of even moving that up by a couple days, you know, just to buy a few more days on the back end, um, or is that, is that you know, as quick as we can possibly do it? Uh, thank you for asking that question. There are 1,500 contracts to write and adjust. If the package goes forward with any increase in salary, uh, each contract must be rewritten. And so there is a process that takes a couple days in HR, and although they're willing to work the weekend, um, it's pushing it to have it electronically in teachers' hands by the 28th. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. So then thank you. Instead, it's a thank you for um, being as accelerated as possible in this process. Um, my second question on the contract timeline is, um, of the still open Coronado positions, um, I believe I can, um, is there another opportunity for in-district teachers to apply? I know that we've opened it up to everybody very early in the process, um, but is there still yet one more opportunity? There are 34 teachers inside SUSD that have been accepted into the model uh, who interviewed and are very excited and we're excited to have them as a part of it. Any teacher going forward once those positions are posted are still welcome to apply and we're hoping that some SUSD staff reconsider and put in an application. Uh, the, the only teachers that are not going to be considered and interviewed are those who have already chose to leave uh, Coronado and who have already been interviewed and told that they were not a fit. They will okay, not thank be interviewed you. a second time. Okay, and that makes sense, and that's terrific because uh, there's a lot of terrific teachers out in the district, and um, certainly we're, I would love to see those teachers apply for those positions with, you know, the appropriate will and skill. So I'm glad to hear that there's that second of opportunity. Um, last, my question on the department share. Um, first a comment um, and then a question. Uh, I wholeheartedly l agree that a leader needs to be not only responsible but accountable for their leadership team. I have never seen a successful organization where a committee decision <laughs> um, recommends the direct reports to the leader. That that just 
you cannot hold someone responsible and accountable if they really don't have the responsibility for hiring um, their leadership team. Ultimately, they're accountable. The, you know, the department chairs do need to perform, but it's, it's that leader's both responsibility and accountability. So I, I understand that that's been in our TEA, maybe a process for a long time, but I do not see that as um, a an, an equation for success in a high-performing organization. Now, there's absolutely opportunity to provide recommendations and for everyone to apply and, you know, to get feedback from others, but I would hope that outstanding department heads that are there will continue to be the outstanding department heads, and um, we need to give the leaders that authority. Now, having said that, I do have a question. Um, we talked about, and I, I really appreciate, Dr. Birdwell, your comments on really, you know, a department chair is an instructional leader. It's not an operational person. There may be some operational responsibilities, but it is an instructional leader. And so we often talk about will and skill. And so is there, it, it, so we'll have a description of what that skill needs to look like. If somebody's on their way, they have the will and they're on the way to developing that skill, is this a developmental opportunity for someone to grow into it if they've showed the potential? Um, and is that something that we can support? Or do you have to already have had that, you know, demonstrative experience of an instructional leader? Thank you for asking that. And, yes, I do think that this is a, a learning opportunity for teachers. I mean, everything that we need to talk about, read, we talk about teacher leaders and the opportunity to grow and learn as a leader, and not, not all teachers have had that opportunity. So we would not exclude somebody because they haven't served as a department chair or they haven't served on a committee. It goes back to um, will, skill, and, and that desire to learn and grow as a leader. So I think you'd have both of those. I think on that team I would envision a mixture of brand-new lead, leaders, teacher leaders, and some teacher leaders who are the master teachers uh, to help others learn. I think it's a very powerful opportunity for all the schools. Yeah. It, it, thank you for that response. And I, I hope our teachers um, actually see that as the incredible opportunity, uh, professional growth opportunity that it can be and that we're prepared to invest in those teachers and see it as a growth opportunity. So I think it's about building a um, high-performance um, pipeline you know, that benefits our students at the end of the day as well as our teachers. So um, thank you for that. And um, those, those are my, those are all my questions. So thank you very much. I realize that this is, um, you know, change, it's back to change, right? When we want to do things differently that have always been done one way, it feels uncomfortable. Um, but at the same time, I've only seen demonstrated um Delivery on every single promise that um, our superintendent and the superintendent's leadership team have consistently delivered on what they promised. And so, um, unfortunately, inheriting, um, you know, a distrustful environment, hopefully we're going to move through that process and deliver on promises. And it might feel uncomfortable, but at the end, when we do the right thing, and I, I hope we build that trust along the way. I know I, as a board member, um, am accruing that trust on a regular basis. And we have great teachers, and I support them as well. And I hope they can, you know, continue to incrementally buy into that trust, too. So thank you for, really, this very transparent process. I appreciate it. Thank you. I know. Yeah. I well. I I will. I um. I'll first ask one of my questions in the next two statements, and then we will have uh, Roni Asali back up to uh, make a few more statements. I think, or or possibly even take additional questions from our board. Um. So, I will. My one of my first questions is, and Board Member Hartman brought up a good point. We we do have in place um, department chairs that um. And they're all different. From what I have heard, the feedback I've gotten, they're all very different in the duties they take on, the responsibilities they, they accept or, or, or um, just choose kind of not, not to uh, take on. But from an operational standpoint, <coughs> what is it currently that they have set aside specifically for that 
stipend or that addendum debt, um, are we saying those I if those if there are those specific items, are they staying with that as well and then it's getting additional? Or are we really talking about a very different position? So we're talking about a different model uh, because we want to loop in elementary and middle and they don't have it at all. Uh, but right now they get funded uh, one hundred dollars per person so in the department. Five hundred dollars per person on their team. So, so we look at designing a set amount to be taken into a leadership role, mm -hmm. and Dr. Burwell working with the, you know what that might look like. So so for instance at Coronado we said there are six English teachers. So the if you have the traditional department chair for that department that person would then receive uh, $3,000. Okay. So it's not the same per department to department. Everybody has a different dollar yeah, amount. Different. So we would look for a consistency that would be an addendum that it didn't matter if you're an elementary, a middle, or a high school, if you serve on the instructional leadership team, you would be paid the same addendum. <coughs> and are there specific operational tasks jobs that have been assigned to department chairs? That, that would be through the conversation with the teachers and the principals that we would okay. take a look at those pieces. Because it, it differs, obviously, yeah. from, from each department chair to each department chair. Okay, that's, that's uh, one of my comments or uh, questions. Thank you. Um, this, this is an incredibly difficult decision, obviously. Um, I think those of us who have been on the board for a very long time and were in a very different culture in the past do not take this decision lightly because we know what it means. We know what a shift it is. But the reality is, for the last eight, nine months, we've been talking about this shift in our district this palpable shift, this positive shift, that this board, our community, our staff, our teachers, our principals, our, our, our parents have been incredibly excited about. And I have always looked at this shift as um, one absolutely necessary because of where we were in the past, absolutely demanded by our community and our stakeholders, including our teachers, including our principals and, and parents and students even, that this shift was necessary. And from day one, it has been about honestly looking in our district, about with looking at the roadblocks that our dysfunction and distrust and lack of accountable leadership put up in front of us when it came to serving our students' needs to the best of our ability. That is, for four years as a board member, what I have talked about with every stakeholder, from parents to teachers to principals, about those roadblocks that have been placed in front of us for decades, as it was stated earlier, for over the decades, over different times, different leaders, different situations, fear, and... and <laughs> obviously economic issues that no one ever saw coming, never mind the incredibly new competitive market that we are currently in that, and those are external besides the budget, but those are also external roadblocks that have been put in front of us that we have to deal with. And this board, for the first time in my four years plus of being a board member, <coughs> has accepted those roadblocks. We have administration that is ready to take them down for us as a community. And it is a little hard for me to process the idea that this TEA is really somehow magically different than all the other dysfunctional <laughs> conversations, the dysfunctional decision-making that was in our district that was born of that lack of accountable leadership that we've had for at least a good decade, all of you that I've spoken with, we know that this didn't just happen. It's just not new. So this TEA was born of that just like our current, our past recent culture was. It is inconceivable to me that we would not also address this and re-examine it and look at the roadblocks that it has in place, just like we've been doing with our administration, with our sites, with our culture of leadership that has been very weak. So 
I don't, I too do not look at it as a slap in the face to teachers. I look at it as this board continuing the work that we have been dedicated to ever since we've, our new leadership has come on board and driven a shift in our district that was much needed. So I hope you can take that all to heart. I hope that, at least for some of us, you know uh, we've earned our stripes, that we listen to teachers, and that we do believe in teacher leadership. We do believe in site leadership. Um, that message uh, wasn't hidden very well over these last uh, for use, for many years for some of us. So I hope you all remember that as we move forward. And somehow we all move forward taking these roadblocks down with trust in each other. I really hope we can. So just want to thank you all for being here. Thank you all for your presentations. And, Roni, I haven't forgotten about you. You are next. Very <laughs> few. Um, Part of the really good work that I've done. So, a few things that I've just done. Uh, to answer your question of how do we make people feel these values, I think that's kind of the crux of the presentation that I've been You have a process that has the first meeting, the first meeting on your so that's very important. Not once has anything come up that says you didn't have an issue. Something is to move on and we need to talk about it. Because it didn't happen at all. So what happened is, when it's 48 hours ago, this, this, when it was shared with us, this point of the board, uh, there's a red line, timeline getting back from that I haven't seen. I don't think, I don't know if we have seen that, I'm not really on the spot. Um, so we're, we're still in the same bubble of teachers are not included, and then and the answer is, well, we just came up with this so the function is the trust or what I heard. Uh, so the function to me is um, rolling things out, and as you mentioned, there are stakeholders that have to for it. Um, I don't know how many teachers I've talked to that are not fired up about these new changes that are almost getting shut down their throat quickly. Like, I don't even know how to keep up with the big stuff that we've said in the time machine. That, that's how fast things are happening. And maybe that's the time to be confident, but on the full side of that we're confident is no one that is the teachers that are sitting here that work all day and all night for students have been approached that says, What do you think about this? Inside of the community, they're gonna be part of this conversation. You will be they're gonna be part of the planning, I promise. But the design of the model, you we, we don't really want to be part of that means uh, things that need to trust in me are things like we have we have a way of how we think we can transfer and we confer and other committees. And even if it's the language is archaic, quote unquote, then we amend that through the process that we have. This trust to me means someone is not happy with a piece of language that we have to agree to. And what ends up happening is it goes to the board that says, hey, we're going to vote take that and by the way, next week, if I'm not happy with the pay structure, we're going to come and ask you to vote that out. And next week, if I'm not happy with crop period, we're going to ask you to take that out. So yeah, that is where that distrust comes from. It's not just the past. It's currently how things are being announced. Because we used to say that that's not going to be a reason in two weeks or two months that is really fitting for what we need. But on the flip side, that's not on our teachers. It's not a matter of not wanting to change. So no, I, don't, I don't think that's, that's fair to say sometimes. Uh, I think it's a matter of wanting change to happen in a way that's thoughtful and meaningful and timely. All three of those things at the same time can happen, but now we seem to see that change is timely, but not thoughtful. Or change is thoughtful, but it takes three years to get something done. There's, there's got to be a middle somewhere, and the last two actions that we have taken have not shown that. So when we come to this function and distrust, you have your perspective and you have the right to have that 100%, but I'm letting you know the perspective from the teachers. It's just that it is dysfunctional and there's distrust and this is not going to help. Okay. I have to ask you a question. Yeah. Because you said that we're affecting teachers' lives. We're not <laughs> ripped anybody. We're not surplusing. We're not, not offering contracts. What we're doing is moving forward the placement of teachers that have been unassigned and letting them know sooner. And then interviewing outside candidates sooner 
and you're saying I'm affecting your life in a negative manner, and I can't figure that out because the teachers are getting the jobs they're asking for sooner. But they're not being denied a contract or a job. It's just being moved forward in a faster process so that we can get out on the market. How is that negatively affecting our teachers? I'm, I'm missing. No, two things. No, no. Uh, thank you for asking that. So two things. One, when we rely on a process, and I walk into my classroom and I go, okay, this is how it's going to go. This is how things are going to work. It is affecting my life when there is a right or a timeline that I'm expecting that gets swept under me. So for example, a bit of teacher that's not. That's that. I love this amount so much. I am a really close to our teacher. So if there's a vacancy in our PDI, I would love to apply for it. Moving the timeline up to your hands today, does not afford them that right because they no longer could apply for a vacancy that they are still currently assigned. So that impacts life that way. The second thing is, you're right. This is a great conversation you and I are having about why are we having that afford me under the vote. That I guess is a bigger question. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the, oh yeah. yeah, sorry. Did any? Oh, I was going to ask if any board members wanted to ask oh. a question as well. Um, Chris just wanted to be here, but she does not post. Yeah, she's thought out the job. Oh, congratulations. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can do our test. My, my apologies for the record. Chris, just congratulations. Congratulations. Okay. Um, maybe we should at this point summarize. Um, Let's maybe start with the department chairs. If we want to go ahead and have a separate motion, if all discussion is uh, done, that uh, maybe we'll summarize a possible motion for the department chair. So Everyone comfortable with that? Yep. In summary, what we're asking you is to send the language regarding department chairs. Um, that's, that's, the that's, end it. Of the that's it. That's so, it. You ready for a motion? Go ahead. So I move to suspend the language with respect to department chairs and the CEA. Thank you, board member Kirby. Do I have a second? Okay. Sorry. Yes, sure. Sorry. In the 2016-17. Oh, in the 2016-17 CEA. Thank you. But, okay. But it's not for the 17. Eight, it's not for the 17-18 school year. It's the TA that we're functioning yeah. now, hiring under. That makes sense. Sorry. I apologize. Yeah. Yes, that makes sense. The current TA. Understood. Yes. Do I have a second? I will second the motion. Um, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, we're not trying to. Uh, department. This is department chair. Yes. Department chair motion. Yes. This is sent. Aye. All right. Motion passes four to one. Thank you. All right. Um, now we are on, and let's look to a serious summary of um, possible motion. Are we going to discuss motion regarding a red line version or a full suspension? Um, we would, uh, we would recommend that you suspend um, and adopt the staffing timeline that Dr. Sitton has given that we will continue to follow the transfer process with the red line version. Uh, of course, yes, if you would like to. Um, but it's the first word you asked, Rony, a question about how it negatively impact the teachers. Explain the response so I can understand how. I think Pam can, yeah. I don't get it yet. Yeah, the first part of you would still be able to transfer. We're going to open it up March 20th. We're not going to hold it open until April 7th, and we're not going to wait until April 13th to play. But anyone can contact the principal between March 20th if they want to be considered for a position. And the, teacher, the principal can go ahead and just take them, or they can go ahead and interview them. Both of those things are still going to remain the exact same. So if a desert mountain teacher want to go our case to open, they can just contact the principal and they can still do that transfer process. We're just not going to leave it open all that long and not be able to look outside until that April 13th timeline. But you can, you yeah. can still apply transfer. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Board Member Kirby? 
Um, so thank you for that response. More, or as important, I thought there's an echo. Yeah. As, <laughs> as importantly, how are we, how is staff going to communicate to the teachers of, for example, the timeline change that you just responded to Board Member Beckham with? We will put out a new timeline tomorrow to all teachers, and then we will also email individually anyone on assignment. Because they're already, we have a group on the unassignments already that's getting emailed and they give us your preference sheet. So we will contact them and let them know the exact timeline. We'll notify them that the meeting is next Wednesday, that's the schedule, and we'll get all the information to unassign tomorrow also. And if I may, I, I'd like to add a perspective that, I mean, I am a very big believer in um, at teachers being education professionals. And so from that lens, as I hear about other teachers already have contracts in other districts, as professionals, I just can't help feeling like that is a moment where you um, you take a look at that uh, your profession and, and what is best for it and say, okay, it is it is in that best interest of my site, my my district, um, and myself as an education professional to figure out the, as fast as I can where I am, where I'll be, where I can't be, and those types of things. So I I'm definitely looking at it through that lens, um, and I hope any fears that um, may be out there that this is just going to be some kind of tool used to punish teachers somehow, um, I hope this discussion has eased some of those fears at least. So um, do I have a motion? I will move to accept the red line transfer language for the so, just to clarify, yes, yes. Board Member. So, your motion, just so that I clear that I understand what your motion is, you are choosing to accept the red line version versus suspension of the language. Okay, suspension of the language. Well, you just, I think you described something a little differently than your motion. Let's be clear there. <laughs> yes. So there is the timeline red line, and there is the team page TEA red line. And so this, this is expediting the transfer process that we just talked about. This is that is what that looks like in the transfer section, but I want to be clear, I did not go through the entire TEA if there's any references back to the transfer. So I took the timeline, redlined it, I went into the transfer section, the actual language in the TEA that second package has, and did a red line within that transfer. But there could be some cross sections, which is why we shall make the point. So if what you were trying to do um, was Take that recommendation and leave the recommendation was suspend the transfer section of the 2016 TA and adopt the new staffing timeline. If that's what you're trying to do, okay. Any more good So, what's so? Make a motion to say what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know before. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. So. I'm not sure I heard the motion. I'm sorry. Okay. Say it again for say it again for, for board okay. member Hartman. Oh. Very loud. Very loudly. <laughs> uh, board member Hartman, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I was trying to capture the recommendation of Dr. Birdwell, and I think I did. Um, the motion would be to suspend the section of the 2016-17 TEA entitled Transfer and adopt the recommended staffing timeline that was presented by Dr. Sitton today to the board. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. All right. And board member Beckham has made that motion. So moved and made that motion. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, board member Kirby. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes five zero. All right.
Thank you all for being here. The conversation. Yes, I would like to call for a two minute break before moving on to item 8A. We are going to uh, beam the meeting here and move on to item 8A. Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Ready to record? I always, I always forget to. I know, I'm so sorry. I forget we're recorded all the time. That's probably a good thing. Are you good? All right. We're going to move on to the information discussion item 8A, review of employee surveys. Um, Dr. Smith? Yes, it's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'd like to uh, just comment for the record that uh, Board Member Hartman has left the meeting, and it's, it's not there. So. But we still do have a quorum. So there you go. So you have a draft, and there's two different surveys you do. You do an employee survey, but because it's very difficult to find out who's going to be working at the department, you look at a site, you break it into two. So the top one you have on your packet is the employee survey that we would send to all schools. And what we did this year is cabinet work through questions. And then aligned it to our core values. We wanted to make sure we were asking questions to each of our core values. And you'll see that a good majority of our students student focused and accountable. And then on the column, I put if we have data from last year, that would be the responses for people that strongly agree and agree with that statement from last year. So obviously some of them are new as you've added some core values, and so you'll see new written down there for if it is brand new. You have that. Behind that, you actually have, what does it look like in format? So what are the actual choices to the questions? Some of them have an NA that doesn't apply. You actually have what the school survey looks like. Behind that, and this was just done, so you, do not, you did not get this sent earlier. I think you had the survey sent earlier. So the third page in your packet is the department survey. And so we asked, we asked as department what they're thinking. So one says on top, elementary, middle, high. The other one says department. And so some of the questions change a little bit. We can interchange the word department um, in them versus school. And the same thing. They look at the core values that we use, how we put in addressing, and we gave you data for last year, and where maybe we put in a new question. And then behind the very last one is what does that actually look like in format for if we're going to send to the department and what it actually looks like. So cabinet, this one is to bring um, very important feedback from employees, really important that we're focusing on what the core values are and making sure we're getting feedback on those core values to help us all improve. Uh, so we're just looking to share with you what we're looking at rolling out in April as our employee survey and get your thoughts. All right. Comments? Questions? <laughs> None? Okay. <laughs> Board Member Beckham? <laughs> and I will warn you, I do lots of surveys. I usually do that small because I look at and go, why in the world are they asking that question? Is that going to be the response to everybody who's just saying that? Get your responses, except for maybe one or two, that's kind of what happens. So I please bear with me. It has nothing to do with you or what you do. So my first question is: this is an in-house survey or is this a cooking survey? In-house. In-house. And what do you do with the information other than just put it into this format and share it with the board in your test? So every year I go back and break it out by school, and all of it is served with school or department. So they get their own results to take a look. So I would pass them on so that the school can reflect on how they're doing or the department head can reflect on how they're doing with the results. And the cabinet would also look at it. Too. We look at the results of it, and particularly like responsive with the new core value that we put in, and one of the things that we put on here is uh, I receive appropriate and timely feedback from my principal. When we sit down with the principal during their evaluation and goal setting, we look at that, and if 30% if of the staff is saying, 
hey, I'm not getting timely feedback. We have a discussion with the principal about that. How are you giving feedback? What kind of feedback do you give? And we talk about that from a goal setting perspective of improvement. Now, that said, let me also say surveys are surveys. I'm going to look for other data to correlate that. So, but that's a great example. I receive appropriate and timely feedback. I like the word appropriate, I like the word timely. But a lot of times, it's a, it's a, in surveys like me, I'll say, yeah, it's appropriate and timely. Where the meaningful would maybe make a difference, which would have more meaning to the district. So, there are little teeny things like that that I think can be tweaked to possibly make this uh, a more meaningful survey when it comes out. Yeah, I would love it. I would love to sit down and go through <laughs> what are some suggestions. And not that I think that my suggestions are all great, but I don't know if you get a lot of people who give you a lot of feedback on this. So I'd love to put it down, give it to whatever you like to write. If you don't, you can just say, nope. We, lo we would love that, and I very much appreciate that, um, just as we'll be asking uh, principals for the feedback and, and others. So thank you. That's why we're bringing it now. We're not planning on giving it to April. But we want feedback, and everybody has a different experience with surveys. So um, we whittled this one down and try to make sure that it aligns core values. But we are welcome to wordsmith and to say, does this really answer anything? I think and that's <laughs> what I would ask that everyone and what is that? And then go, oh no, and Oh, yeah. yeah. I've offered you yeah. yeah. that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Right. I will have the time. Hey, I will remember who likes service. Not me. Both of us never grab it. I, I don't mean to be like, you yes, is what our Oh, no, good. I think I did see that on there. I think I did. Um, it's the fourth one down. There are clear indicators of instructional leadership by my principal of my school. Yeah. A little bit awkward language. I need to work on that. But we are looking for, are they the instructional leaders? And then we, for high school, we want to ask about the recent school of Some of them are responsible for departments, the department. Great. Who asked principals what they'd like to know about us? Oh, I'm in the, in the past, my experience is that I've broken off the assistant principals into a little subcategory because it's based on functions like there's five questions for and services, five for AD, five for and very specific things the principal's looking for. Any other comments? I am um, I'll I'll be brief. Um, oh, sorry. You good? Uh, I'll be brief. I uh, yeah, I come to this with a lot of skepticism, I have to be honest. Um, I don't uh, value them tremendously. Um, I would agree with Dr. Birdwell that I would need a lot of other factors to validate a type of survey like this. Um, certainly as parent who's filled out a few, when you have those questions that have several layers, like is it this, this, and this, then that's a twin cost of how you're going to answer. Am I going to say yes to this and no to this? I'll just say yes anyway. I, I that is something maybe to be careful of moving forward is make sure those questions are have one layer to them so a parent doesn't have to really struggle and, and juggle their answer. Um, I on another level, I am very concerned about the timing of this survey. Um, I I appreciate and, and acknowledge that, you know, there's not a whole lot of questions of are you happy, is things going great, and that's good. I do like the focus of, of a lot of the questions about the data-driven instruction and, you know, those types of things that we really are trying to move forward to. But that being said, I've used this analogy before. Um, I, I believe we were a very unhealthy district, and we are in the process of getting healthy. And that takes a lot of physical therapy and treatments and 
and painful things, and it's to me it's like asking a patient right in the middle of some very painful physical therapy, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's what this was like to me a little, and I'm just going to leave it at that for right now. This is just discussion. I am just giving (laughs) giving that info to that point. Um, Oh, (laughs) Ms. McCauley. No, no. <laughs> I'm not really making any strong suggestions of how this should look. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. I, I like it. I like the efforts there. That's great. Board Member Kirby. Um, you know, I want to echo Board Member Perleberg's sentiment about just um, my past experience with SGSC surveys. Um, don't place a lot of value in it. Um, the other layer that you didn't mention is response rate, um, which is a, a huge piece of this. Um, and I, 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 I very much agree that we are in the middle of um, we are in the middle of making changes to move the district forward. But they are what they are; they're changes, and we know how humans react to change. And um, the timing is just not good. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know if there's any opportunity to flex the timing. I don't know that I even want. To, I guess I would just say, if we don't flex the timing, that we really make sure that we evaluate the answers um, along with the response rate, and in the context of the current decisions we're making at the board. If I might say, the only thing that we're doing a survey is the board member Hartman, since she's not on the desk. That's true. She has, has left us. Uh, asked us to do one, and we're trying to very respectfully do that. This is not a good year to do a survey, because I think I could probably get the answer. But in the same hand, these are about individual principals and buildings, and they should get feedback from their staff. We're not asking whether you like the superintendent. We took all the superintendent questions out, because it looks like the original survey was a superintendent's evaluation form. <laughs> and I'm going to say at this point, why I took them out because uh, the teacher's going to evaluate the users. So uh, he puts them back in. <laughs> um, but I have to tell you that surveys vary. That's why I say you have to put other data. If somebody says that my principal is not being um, uh, an instructional leader, then I'm going to look at the professional development on the campus. I'm going to look at whether or not the, the principal um, has the, the training in order to do the PGP. So it does sometimes create little red flags that give us a chance to go look at some things. We look at, are you doing walkthrough protocol? Uh, are you collecting data and giving it back to teachers when you walk through? So there are some pieces that kind of red flag for us that allow us to get back and coach principals on their leadership. And, so, and so those types of red flags are in here. You're confident that... Yeah, they're in there. So and and they're used red to flags. coach the principal. Uh, they're not used to hammer the principal. They're used to coach the principal. So... In that regard, I like the survey, but I I have a hard time believing anything on the survey. I, I don't know that that's just pessimistic, <laughs> or I just spent too many years looking at survey data that seemed the same year after year after year after year. And God bless parents for being willing to fill out the advanced accreditation surveys that we have to give them that are very lengthy, um, and we're judging on. Yeah, board member Kravitz. Um, what is the process for an employee for taking the survey with regard to privacy? Do they get, do they get, would they get it in email or is it something they log in? Hey, I know there's been concerns. Mm-hmm. I have heard of concerns in the past that, oh, they'll be able to see who completed the survey. So that's one question. And then what safeguards will there be so that people can't take the survey more than once? I know as when I would get the survey from the history, I could log in and take that survey several times, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, Candy. <laughs> 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 I'm just curious. Like, I know. I'm horrified right now. <laughs> Have had conversations with CAP. We could set it up so it requires their ID number. 
then it becomes that issue of people know your answer, so we've never gone down that far. So, so yet another uh, layer of take it and so, the brain. Yeah. When we sit down and, yeah. and let's say that there are 100 teachers on a campus, and we pull it out and we say to the principal, well, you only have 50 teachers from your campus answer it. But then you have 180 answers. <laughs> we say, okay, so this survey is null and void because you don't have 100, you have only 100 staff members, so obviously people did it more than us. Uh -huh. So that, you know, you, we plead to the professionalism of the teachers to be professional. Um, I've had experience in other districts where we even saw an email in another district where uh, the association said, go on and take it as many times as you can. And, and so then we'll make that how I said, we saw, you know, a campus of 100 have 178 responses. So then that no one would the entire, so the board just threw them out and we threw them out. So we have to ask for the professionals and we'll work with Julie on that. We'll promote that we be professional in that process. But I've experienced exactly what you said, you know, multiple logins and, but the moment we ask for an ID, then people say retracting their answers. And we're like, you know, we don't want that. But there is that culture of, of just trusting it. So we'll ask for professionalism and ask that they cooperate. Board Member Beckham. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julie? Thank you. 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 Um, I wish there could be a one response only. You know, we run ours through ADA that allows that, but they do have to log in with their their ID number. Um, I think it's important. Thank you. I personally have always felt that someone's going to ask me a question and going to answer it, so that doesn't bother me. But there has been that as the excuse of not providing feedback. I, I, I would agree with that. I've got a tremendous, as a board member, a lot of feedback from teachers saying, you know, we saw these surveys. Of course, I don't either don't respond or don't answer honestly because they, if I tell them what school I'm at and how many years I've been there, and, and they figure out who I am. And that fear, that's, that's what I've heard. So. Take it with a great salt. I mean, the other thing to do is real paper and pen, and that's just hours and hours of tabulation, and it just doesn't yeah. happen in shades and gun. So, it, and obviously, I, I want to respect, and Board Member Hartman's not here to kind of talk about her reasoning and rationale. Um, and I want to respect that, but from your staff's position, um, are, there, are there any downsides to going ahead and putting the survey out? And are we sure this is worth the time and energy right now? The timing is critical. I think we need to do it in April. We need to do it so the responses are back in time to talk to principals before their contract. In May, we'd like to use it as a conversation with principals. Um, any earlier than that, you can go ahead and figure out what your responses are going to be. Now, I say April, why? Because we think teachers need to be contracted, see that we're living our words, that we're doing what we say we're doing, and hopefully that will help with the culture and climate issues. But I think April's a good time to do it. Um, I will tell you my experience also um, in other districts is teachers will say to me, I've been waiting for that survey to ask my thoughts about leadership. Are you going to do this? And, and I think we really need to do that every April. I think that they need to give their feedback, and it needs to be done in a manner so that the principal knows where the staff is. Aaron? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're going to get some feedback. Yeah. Yay. Okay. And we're going to wrap back up. So talk to some principals, talk to some teachers. I'm sure we're going to wrap back to Julie and some others in order to make sure that we get good feedback all the way around and then we'll get that done. And I apologize because I have a phone call from my sister and mom's in the hospital. So if you don't mind, I'm going to step out. Absolutely. Yeah. No problem at all. I'm sure Dr. Nessie can take over. Um, oh, so we will move on to item information discussion item 8B, update on Pima Elementary School instructional model. Dr. Mann. Hello. Yeah. I may have seen the each at the principal student that come on up here maybe who can right there and help me answer any questions you may have. We have just a short PowerPoint here for you to talk about. I 
Talk about proposal or recommendations for you as you consider the rebuild of FEMA Elementary School. There's been some discussion about the concept of a traditional program in the south part of the district. We had an opportunity to have conversations at FEMA with quite a few of the teachers. I spent an entire day there a couple of weeks ago with Amy. And I think we talked to probably about two-thirds of the staff on an individual basis and had conversations about where you are instructionally, how do you view traditional schooling, and of course there's an excitement about a new school there that came about as well, but the discussion was primarily about traditional school. I know that FEMA is probably about as close to traditional school without being an official traditional school as any school in the district. And so the jump to traditional instruction and traditional curriculum will not be a huge leap. There are, I know there are at least 15 or 16 teachers that at one time had gone through training for school and I was part of that, so I know they did that. Now, um, I had several of those teachers during that visit say, I don't know where that box of stuff is in my box, but I haven't used it for a while. <laughs> and I had to remind them, your training was a long time ago. You would have to do it again. And uh, okay, okay. So let us share some ideas with you about traditional school at Pima. First of all, we would like to recommend that Pima reopen as, and, and you see K5, K6, We've had the discussion both ways there in a new facility in, the, in August of 2018. Have the discussion, and I have to really tell you that every single conversation I had, and they get to a point to talk to them about great structure. Is K-5 working for you? Would sixth graders stay? Would seventh and eighth graders stay in the form of a K-8 school? And every single person said, we don't believe our 7th and 8th graders would stay. They are very happy with their middle school options at this point. I also asked them, and, and a number of them are also parents that with kids at the school and live in the community. Maybe is one of those people. Do you hear anything in your community about a desire to go K-8? Every single person I talked to said, no, we hear nothing about that. And I started asking the question about sixth grade. Well, what about sixth grade? It hasn't been that long since you had sixth graders on your campus. And, and it was a lot of the same discussion. No, I don't think I would keep my kids for sixth grade because they're very happy going to their middle school and being part of the activities and the athletics and the programs that the middle school offers. And so the desire to change from K-5, I did not see that. And I'm going to ask Amy to make a comment on that as well. No, I, I, I believe that our families are really happy with our middle school options. Um, and just like Dr. Nance said, that at K-5 seems to be more of, of the attraction for our site based on just conversations and um, past history there. I have not had parents approach me with that desire for Pima to be the K-8. Our student body is very involved in their athletics and their music and their performances that they get at the middle school level. So um, the conversation again has been really in that case. If I could jump in with a question. Do you know the retention rate we have of FEMA fifth graders staying, either going on to Mojave or, or staying in our district? Do, do we know that number? Dr. McCullough, I don't know if she has it right now, but she can certainly get it to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. While he's looking, let me just kind of go ahead and, and talk about a few other pieces up here. We'd like to recommend that you don't change the FEMA boundaries. When you talk about traditional schools, some districts have traditional schools that are schools of choice. Other districts keep the boundaries intact. And it's a neighborhood school, but it's also a traditional school open to open enrollment from other places. And our recommendation is that we not disrupt the current FEMA boundaries that are in place, that those stay the same. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about a sister school. My experience, and I've worked with traditional schools now in, in four different districts, is that when a traditional school is established, you will always have a handful of folks that don't want to go there, especially if you have your own boundaries, because that's their home school. A choice school doesn't have that issue because you just don't choose to go there. But when you have boundaries for a school, typically you will have a very few, and my experience is very few, that would choose to go to a different school. And I believe that in most cases, we need to say, we will bust you to a particular sister school. And I'm not here to say what school that would be at this point. We are a year out from, from some of these things taking place. But that transportation be provided from FEMA to that sister school. I can tell you that in my experience doing this, I never needed more than a van to do so. There were never more than six or seven kids from the entire school whose families chose to go somewhere else. Board Member Kirby. So um, operationally, Dr. Nance, how would that transportation of the sister school work? Would it be... The, uh, because it sounds like more more buses, more transport. How does there would be some additional transportation. And like I said, it's typically not going to require a large school bus to do so. A van could do it. But certainly you wouldn't need so, a driver. You wouldn't need an available van to do so, so you have the route in the neighborhood that go to Pima. Yes. But then you have another route that goes through the entire neighborhood and goes to a sister school? And that is problematic because right now... Our schools start at the same time. So in order to be transported from home to FEMA and get on another bus or van to be transported to the next school, they will never be on time. And that's what? not what I said, though. I okay, said, I'm not sure I so but that is an option. But what I was asking is, do you have buses that will run the FEMA neighborhood to FEMA and then have another bus that runs the Pima neighborhood to the sister school. No. Or remember, Kirby, if you had enough kids to justify that, you could. Or a van or whatever. Or a van or whatever. Is it a separate vehicle? I'm talking about picking kids up over here and over here and way over here and, you know, blocks and in some cases miles from each other, unless you have enough in one area, that would become problematic. And I can't answer the transportation director's issues at this point that certainly something we can So if they're both problematic, how does it work? What I've seen happen in other districts would be parents would get their students to the school and at a designated time of an Antarctic bus would deliver we'll students right. from one school mm -hmm. to the other. Okay, thank you. Okay. And then lastly, that the 17-18 school year be used for teacher training and staff development for the FEMA teachers centered around traditional school and philosophy. The really nice thing we're talking about here is we have time. We have training time. We have development time. We have time to purchase materials, implement them along with the training. Um, that would start probably this summer once that decision is made. Did you have anything yet? Absolutely. We are seeing matriculation rates right around um, from 2010 to 2015, which is currently at 90 percent. So that's pretty good. The average for the distance is in the So what about from 6 to 7? That's already in. Could I ask about 4 to 6? Okay. <laughs> in the so meantime, we, in the district, we usually see, we usually see the, the, the draw. Yeah. Um, Board Member Kravitz, did you have a question? Um, did you speak did just with teachers or also with um, parents and guardians? My conversations were with staff members at the school. I have to turn it over to Amy at, at this juncture, it's really just been a site-based conversation um, about the traditional model, training, and shifts, and the instruction, and things of that nature. Um, so at this juncture, the bulk of our conversation happens. So we don't know yet whether the community is really I mean, it's teachers do, and that's great. Don't get me wrong. We have not totally done that. You know, um, I just want to go back to this. This is not a lot of change for what's happening okay. to you today. 
Okay, let me talk a little bit about what traditional school looks like, what would it look like at Pima, and these are the ideas and the conversations that we've had so far. This is very common to what you will see in a traditional elementary school pretty much anywhere. Um, Facts and math, that is a program that you will see typically in most traditional elementary schools. It's what shine in in grades K through 6. Solving phonics is typically used in traditional elementary schools, and we would be training teachers on both facts and math and solving phonics and moving ahead. I would love to see that training happen sooner than later so that as we move through the next school year, some of that could already be implemented as we look towards opening a new school the following year. Social studies and science, you're going to see a traditional school follow the district curriculum. It's very, very little different than the curriculum itself. Same specials as other elementary schools. Objectives, both is direct instruction. Again, and you'll hope that's happening everywhere, but certainly there'd be an emphasis on it. Required teacher group planning and consistency and lesson presentation. And I'm going to have Amy talk a little bit about that because my conversations seem to be you're already doing that. Yeah, our teachers are already meeting in professional learning communities and their PLC. Um, they plan the calendar and map out. Uh, they have a sub day twice a year to do that. So they're mapping out their instructions so they're in sync with one another. They do common formative assessments together, which then basically dictate their instruction. And so they're planning those out, they're working together. So in order to do those common formative assessments and to have data dialogue about them, they have to be in line with one another. Otherwise, when they sit and look at their data, they can't determine basically where the strengths and weaknesses are instruction, where they need to reteach, where they need to extend that lesson. And so they are already meeting in PLCs once a week, talking about uh, student instruction. So they're planning, they're doing their units of study together for ELA, they're mapping those out, they're sharing those materials. They're in line right now with PTLA with one another. So those things are already happening. That's already common practice. Yeah, very little change would most likely be needed in that. Traditional classroom setup, what that means is that in a traditional, elementary school, the majority of the instruction is teacher-led. That doesn't necessarily mean all the desks are in rows, but they're all facing the teacher. And so you're going to see some different configurations, but primarily set up so the teacher-directed instruction is the focus. Minimal disruptions to instructional time by non-curricular activities. Valuing time, valuing instructional time is really important at a traditional school. And it's really important at every school. But there's a focus on it at traditional school. And so that would be up to the staff working with the principal to make sure that time is really used widely throughout the day with minimal disruptions. And then as we're looking for consistency in homework and the way instruction happens in classrooms, certainly there would be an, an emphasis on Finding ways to train parents on how to best help students with homework, helping parents understand what solving phonics and text and math is all about, and having those evening events and those times for parents to get together and, and to be honest, make the materials to use at home and do those kinds of things as well. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. So, um, Cheyenne, as a traditional school in our district, is held in very high regard um, by the, their community as well as the district at large. If you go back to the prior slide, what you've described here in K-5 or K-6, so I'm, I'm taking 7-8 off for this question, is this, is this what Cheyenne's doing? Or is Cheyenne doing this plus something or not all of this? Is it, does it you know, this is very, very similar to what you see happening in Cheyenne as far as this structure, okay. absolutely. Because and maybe in, I hear um, the community at Cheyenne, they, they really they value their humanities classes, but is that a 7-8 yeah. set of middle school? Okay. And then what about language? Well, again, we would make sure that the world language piece is equitable to any other elementary school in the district, and I know that... Dr. McNeil has been working on that, and you already have it. So. Okay, but is it, is it, does it start the same as when Cheyenne starts it? Is it the same, or is it different? Is Cheyenne different than every other, I'm sorry? It's a K-5 program. But I think the question is what's happening at Cheyenne. Yeah, what's happening at Cheyenne? It's not different. 
I do think it's Oh, it is different. I can't hear We've got to Cheyenne teach. Can she answer? Yeah, yeah. Can I remember in the grade? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Seventh grade. And then the eighth grade class is the middle grade. So it's a middle school. It's only middle. So it's a middle school model. So they don't, so Cheyenne does not have an elementary language. So what you're saying is, is this. Well, what do they already do? So they keep it. So then what would they, what would this Pima traditional not have that Cheyenne does have? <laughs> so what does Cheyenne do in that, in the, in the, in the time, the minute that Pima would use for elementary language? language? Oh, what is Cheyenne doing? It's more PE yeah. or more music or more art. It's yeah. a trade-off special time. We have a 6K rotation for special, and so we can rotate through PE, R, PE. Okay, so it's more special. So it's really, it's really the same thing as one period of special. Okay. Uh, thank you. I was unclear on my question, but thank you. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and I will say that the, the, while the Cheyenne teachers here, when we visited Cheyenne, the teachers uh, just immediately volunteered to say, it's Pima goes this direction. We are here for them. We have folks who have been trained as instructors, and we would love to have them come see our classrooms and, and be able to have conversations with them about great Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gracious, gracious, gracious. Um, Remember, second. So as I look at this, and, and I'm somebody who actually this is an individual like the traditional method. But one of the things that I think that we're trying to do is be a choice district, and we've got competitive competitors And just looking at this, I don't think this makes us competitive. It actually, in somebody who has chosen where my kids have gone to school, it doesn't give me everything else that I could get at one of the charter schools. And it doesn't do two things. One is, it looks like a model from an old model. Even the new charter schools have some innovation in it, even though they're using very traditional facts and quality. But this doesn't have a business great book program, which is the communities you're talking about, which they're often. It's also, when you say, but I think what really hit me hard, it didn't feel good. Traditional classrooms set up, objective focused direct instruction. Even though in those schools, if you walk in, it may be set up this way, and I know it's not how the desks are set up, and the teacher is giving direct instruction, but what's happening is the Socratic method. The kids are answering the questions instead of this. When I read this, I think that the teacher up in front, that traditional method, and even though you want a traditional structure with the solving the Saxon, Parents are wanting their kids to really get that cognitive thinking. And, and what you get with the great book, I'm not seeing that. So I think even if it's from a marketing standpoint, you're thinking you're going to, need, you need to be putting that in. Otherwise, I'm probably still going to go to my church. Let me respond to that. I still remember back on what you're talking about our instructional strategies. We should be doing it at all of our schools. That has nothing to do with the traditional model. It has to do with good instruction. And those are things I absolutely agree with you with further academic achievement wherever they would be. And so it's something we need to work on across the board to improve instruction and academic achievement at all. So now let me talk about the curriculum piece of that. We've challenged first, um, and Dr. Benson has been working on this, a backwards design of the AP honors model. Um, because once you backwards design that, You've got to start getting the great books in. So, and Dr. McCauley and I, being prior English teachers, have had an emphasis and conversations with, eventually we've got to get more of the great books, but it's not just in the traditional, it's in all of our schools. So as we do that curricular design, um, and then the other piece of that, I'll throw one more piece in, the Greek and Latin teaching of the Greek and Latin roots has got to come back as well. Um, and so that's another piece that Dr. Benson and I have discussed. So as we're making the curricular movements, you're going to see some of those get integrated into the curriculum. Right. Let me go back a piece that I should have mentioned and I, I really didn't. On facts and math. The goal of facts and math is to have every student in the school working a year ahead. And when we see traditional schools that have been around for a while, that is pretty close to happening. That is our goal, is that eventually, now certainly in year one, 
You're never going to get to a year ahead. In year two, you're going to get closer. On about year three and year four, you can be there if you do it the right way. And so that is something that would be a goal of, I would hope, any traditional school that uses sex and math because it's something that makes it a little easier to do because of the spiral. Mm -hmm. Spiral way sex and math those kids through the grade. The goal is to prepare kids so that when they leave Kima, they're ready for pre-algebra in sixth grade, algebra in seventh grade, geometry in eighth grade. So that would be the ultimate goal. Will you get every student there? Not every one of them. Will you do it the first year? No. But that's the, that's the goal. So I just wanted to make sure I mention that if you forgot to do that. Can I ask a quick question to yeah. that point? So Again, I think to, for our parents, that clear path is always very important. We are talking about a K-5 or K-6. Is there that clear path when you talk about, you know, pre-algebra, sixth grade, seventh grade, is that very clear at Mojave? Very doable happening already? That type of thing, like they can already see that is exactly what all get continued on at Mojave for these parents? Well, again, it will, it will eventually, eventually. Eventually. Eventually get there. I can tell you... Uh, uh, Dr. Wong, working with the gifted specialists right now at our elementary school, is working on accelerating math instruction. So that not just our traditional schools, but that certain capable, hardworking, motivated kids at all of our schools that are willing to get to that point can do so. And so we hope to be able to drastically increase the number of seventh graders in algebra, for example, over the next few years. It's going to take a little while to get there. Our goal as a district, long term, should be that all eighth graders are in algebra. Yes. Yeah. Now, it'll take a while to get there, and if we can get 90% of them in there, 80% be thrilled. There are, are, are districts who refuse to teach algebra in eighth grade. But the, the districts who are putting out high academic achievement, one of the correlates that we look for are that eighth graders have hit algebra and are successful. Are successful. So that's the, the meaningful piece. So that should be our goal as an entire district, that all eighth graders um, should be aiming towards algebra. And, and then you know that you're getting the academic rigor that you need to be getting as you go into high school. We're, we're not there by any means. So, uh, Member Kirby, I want to come back to, if, if, unless you want me to wait, um, the K-5, K-6, K-8 question. Um, and again, because our one traditional school in the district is very successful, very highly regarded, and is a K-8, how do you respond to the community that what we all believe is a very successful model, it's been the discussion for years, why don't we just replicate Cheyenne why, what's your answer? Why are we not replicating Cheyenne? And I have to come back with a question for you. Why do you think it's more successful? What makes it more successful than another K-8 school or another elementary middle school combination? Your test scores. Over at school wide. Now, I'm not looked at at grade level by grade level. Yeah. School, their okay. test scores are higher. Their enrollment's higher. And the, their commute, the, the street talk, the soccer talk, is that it's very highly regarded in the whole district. Yeah, and they know. have, and they are constantly getting new kids trying to get in there. However, and I, and I have to say, okay. I think that's a fair comparison to compare one side of the district to another. You're talking about very, very different issues. You're talking about a Title I school versus um, a school with very, very low pre reduced lunch rate. You're talking about some differences in the makeup of the student body. There's some very big differences. So I don't know that I would I'd get into higher achieving school versus the lower achieving school. What I would look at is our students staying there more than they do within our other feeder patterns. I think the other piece that has not been looked at, if I might say, is that Cheyenne, there is a, a belief that Cheyenne has a tough, because People have said Cheyenne's the top scoring middle school in the district, and the answer to that is that's not true. The top scoring um, in, in English is Mountainside Middle School, are the top scoring students in the 7th uh, and 8th grade. 
there are three three schools that score continuously high in their endowment college curriculum. If I've read my data wrong, but Copper Ridge, um, Mountainside, and Cheyenne go back and forth between the top of that, and you're talking about three totally separate models. So one's a middle school, one's a K-8, and one's a traditional. And so a part of so you have to look beyond just uh, so. But the reputation is that this is our top scoring school in the district. And they're a great school, and they're doing well, but they're not the top scoring middle school in the district. They, uh, they fluctuate that, but they're in high competition to two other schools. And another one is Mojave? Cocoa Pop, excuse me, Cocoa Pop. And so part of that um, is kids who come from affluent families and communities with an already natural uh, desire and respect of, of education and a vision that I'm going to go beyond uh, high school, so I'm learning here now and I'm accelerating. So uh, some would say, well, uh, Mountainside did really well in, in uh, language arts because of the fidelity of Springboard. Well, that's about the teacher and the quality of the teacher, uh, not necessarily the curriculum. Because I can give you another curriculum and I can give you the great books curriculum and I can get the same high performance. Right. So the teacher matters, uh, the curriculum matters, and what a child and a family bring to that learning matters. We, in a, in a title school, um, are going to fill gaps, make up lost reading and exposure to reading from an earlier, much earlier age in a Title I uh, child. The vocabulary has, needs to be closed. The ability to write at a higher level has to be closed. So there are more elements we're dealing with. So as Dr. Nance was saying, to compare the title school to the affluent community is somewhat unfair at this stage. So you say, why wouldn't I just duplicate it? Um, you're not the same population. You should be offering a similar opportunity. But 7, 8 wise, that curriculum is being taught at Mojave as well. The same curriculum that's being taught at Cheyenne is being taught at Mojave. And how is Mojave compared to Cheyenne? So, I get, so you Mojave come, done a very different demographic. So, so how does Mojave then compare to Cicero or Noah Webster? Same demographic. Have we looked at that? Noah Webster. Daniel Webster's a <laughs> <laughs> historic figure, I think. <laughs> Noah Webster. <laughs> but it's just, I guess, I just want to, I want to, I don't, I accept your answer. I get it. But I, we have, we heard it with Hohokam and Supai. And I'm telling you, we have lost so many families who, even though Mojave has improved tremendously, I'm talking 10 years ago, the flight started because they didn't want to go to Mojave. It's that demographic. And if we can prove that today we are delivering a better 7-8 academic achievement than where you went when you left us, we need to get that message out there. And if we can't prove it, then we need to figure that out, not only in Supai, but also at Mojave and whatever other Middle school sure. that. So the retention rate of 90% is really, is really, really good. But, but, it's, but hang on a second. I've got to respond to that. And it's, but you're, you've already lost everybody. You're, reti you're retaining this narrow sliver of your community that you've kept. But what is our capture rate? That's the question. What's our capture rate? So we're, we're retaining those that we've captured and we've lost this other piece. Mm -hmm. Although retention is important to me, I'm going to go back to something Mrs. Beckham said. If we want to be the choice, mm -hmm. and I don't want you to choose Noah Webster, and I don't want you to choose Great Hearts, and I don't want you to choose Basics, but I want you to choose it in district school, there's a greater grading of the bar. Now, away from the K-8 message, I think we need to spend next year, and I talked with the academic leadership team, studying the middle school model, yes. whether you're in a 7-8 or a 6-8, but we as a district must spend some time looking at what's happening in the middle school. And we must take time, because it really doesn't matter whether you're the K-8 structure or you're the middle structure, what are we doing academically? So let's study the core piece, but let's also study the elective piece, and let's study how well students are doing in a K-8 
Copper Ridge in versus to a middle school model mm -hmm. in versus to um, Cheyenne's traditional. Are there differences where kids are accelerating because we have a different structure or a different opportunity? But it's going to be very much based on what are we doing academically with the students. And recently I've discovered that there are some issues within the middle school that need to be addressed. Everything from students being placed in TAs where there should be no TAs, that means like sitting for 45 minutes without instruction, to um, honors classes that are labeled honors that aren't honors. Uh, those are all affecting the academic rigor of middle level. And, and then once you get that structure fixed for all, then you need to say, have I created a pathway choice for accelerated learning? And that is part of that 12-month conversation that we ought to embark on over the next 12 months as a district. And I challenged our academic learning team to do that, and I got um, a huge support from everybody in the room that that is a really critical issue. Yes, yeah, it is. So as the academic leaders in this district, we're going to really tackle that and it's a 12-month a, a strong study about what's happening in the middle level. But we are not getting it done at the middle level. The academic rigor is not there. We're feeling it in the high school. We're also seeing it academically. We see scores begin to go up in the elementary, and then we see the drop off 6, 7, and 8. And that should not happen, and that doesn't have to happen like that if we do things properly in our curricular and our supportive teachers at the middle level. Thank you. Okay. I just want to add to that, too. When you, when you look at the probably the hallmark curriculum pieces of a traditional school, fact and math and solving problems. Those are only elementary books. Mm -hmm. um, I believe Shine is the fifth grade. Who needs solving problems? Solving doesn't even publish material beyond the sixth grade. Well, you do review yeah, all Okay. And then when you get to the facts and math piece, what we want to have happen is that students are in grade algebra, algebra, and geometry once they get to that middle school level. And we have districts adopted pre algebra, algebra, geometry type books that are used across all of those programs, whether it be a high school or a middle school. So that program is consistent across, across all of our schools. Thank you. Let me talk just real quickly about what does it cost? Certainly, you have to buy some of your materials and train your teachers. And so you already looked at the cost of the, really it's buying the facts and materials for an entire school of students. It's providing training. And Saxon doesn't provide a lot of training. We would have to do a lot of in-house pieces with that. Um, they'll train you how to read your manuals and do that kind of thing. But there's not a lot of external training that I've been able to find. Solving phonics is an intensive training that teachers go through, and it's typically over a two-year period or two parts of that. It can be done in the summer, it can be done in an after-school thing, and Amy's going to work with teachers to find out when they would prefer to do so. We would want to pay teachers to do that. If we're paying them, if they're coming in the summer and they're in the training, we want to go pay them to do that. So that would be the cost there. And then there's some ongoing material costs for a school the size of FEMA, and that's based on numbers of students. We really feel like we can take the, the facts and books, the facts and curriculum out of our capital on the you know, July 1st, and then we can use our BSEC budget for the training pieces moving forward. So that the board has a full answer on this. And we want to hear that so when they have to ask that question, that's it. Cheyenne did not have the same support when they started, and we are supporting them now. And I, I just want you to know that you may hear from community members, well, okay, when they started, Cheyenne didn't get that. But I want you to know we are now picking up and supporting Cheyenne in a much better fashion than it's been in the past, including um, with, the, with the construction that's going to happen on Cheyenne's campus, the science support that that campus is going to give is going to be amazing. So, uh, But I want to be very clear about that. that you may hear from the community members that but we didn't get that support. We know that, and we're very sorry about that. But going forward, we are supporting. You. Thank yeah, you. I was very surprised in the conversation with the Shining Principal earlier in my, my time coming back to Scottsdale was that most of that was paid for their parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, this is our the curriculum we're providing for the school district to pay for it. We now do. Remember, Becca. So what you're saying is we spend thirty thousand at Cheyenne on an ongoing basis. These numbers. 
Well, why would you say well, you say well, now or it's or it's it's purchasing the well, it's the add on materials. The would be for new people to say come on. Yeah. Yeah. There's also some add on materials that they need every year and they've had to go to their PTO year after year to ask for that. We are now put that into our capital dollars and we're taking care of it for them. I was well, shocked to find out when I got here as well. I was like, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, and, I'm sorry, and just to clarify though, that 30000 for the tiers, that is the entire staff for the first yeah. first two years, and then it will drop off after that as it's just new staff, correct? Yeah, right. Okay, all right. And refreshing training, but it's more material driven um, that we're supporting Cheyenne with. Well, remember, Becca? So the other, the other thing that's about the traditional method, and you brought it up when you talked about the demographics, Demographics go very well up in the Cheyenne area. You could have some, since this is a Title I school, kids that are not used to the discipline and be sitting for as long to do the homework with Saxon and the tonic and the So I would like to see some additional funds for the the family. I love how you had, you know, <laughs> training for the parents. Yeah. But there's no money for that. I, can, I can I just... <laughs> for the training and for the actual support for the kids to bring them up. We know if they had a one, they're not going to the preschool. So kids, those kids are kids that need to give them support. They can do it. I, I, I like that sentiment very much, but I will speak. Um, we were a Title I school when my children went there and started. Um, and... I saw no problem, really, with the community embracing the expectations of the school. Um, that, I mean, that demographic existed then. It's fairly similar now, I would assume, I believe, from what I've heard. Um, they they embraced the expectations. They embraced the work. They embraced um, the culture on the campus. And that Title I factor, I didn't ever see it being a problem. To me, it, it fit wonderfully. <laughs> well, I'll just throw that as someone who lived it. Why wouldn't you accept the same test scores when you have to can? Well, we'll get there, but you have to close the gap. Is what we're saying. You have to. You have right. to I, I want to be able to close that gap. But you can't do that without well, additional contribution. But if I can jump in, back in the day, I hate to say it that way. But no, no offense. I mean, I'm sorry, but but I'm familiar with those years, not not these current years. Our test scores were very competitive. And they, they were very competitive. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I wasn't trying to suggest that. I was just, I only know my experience. <laughs> yeah. This is Beckham. I, 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 I just want to say something to you here that I think is really important, and I, I think you're on to something that's critical. We should never lower expectations of kids of Title I. Right. It's one of the greatest flaws of our system is to say because of the child's rooftop or the environment which they come from, that they can't. So to your point, you're actually right. We should be expecting that. It's going to take some time to close some of those pieces. There are definite things that you do, in, um, and it's wonderful, wonderful research and <coughs> behind working with kids in poverty that will, will help uh, embrace it. But there are also other programs and agencies that actually support, and they will they will help us provide readers for young children. They give away books for families, and we'll be tapping all of those resources to support those families where the need is at. Um, and the parenting classes are critical. The other piece that we're working on is remember that expansion of preschool, um, expanding our Title I preschools, and expanding some summertime uh, preschool opportunities. All of those will play into closing those gaps. But we should never lower the academic expectations of the child based on the title school or not. And, and that's one of the great things that, that Pima has had some historical scores equal to its peers of affluent community. And that's what we're, we're aiming to get back to. Yeah, I think so. If I just clarify, I apologize, but I didn't hear how you answered Pam differently. I, I was asking, um, I, I basically was addressing the six, seven, and eight. Which are currently at Mojave, not Pima. So she, she's looking at the current numbers, and I'm showing the current academic numbers. If you don't change the structure and the expectations, we will continue to see a gap in the south to the north because of the, of the other factors. If you change the expectations and you change the instructional processes and fidelity to it, you will equalize that. The great, the great equalizer in our society. For kids of poverty 
is in education. We've got to bring the south end up and set the same expectations that we set for the north end, and, and we can get there. Um, did I give the impression that... No, no, no. Are, no, I'm re no, no, I'm just reemphasizing what you said okay. from a different perspective, because there were two different conversations. First was about the current kids today. Yours is about as we go forward, and I wanted to say, you're spot on. Let's not lose your point. Well, then I think that we should ask some fun. They receive additional funding okay. as ten more yeah. schools in the district. You know, and what you're talking about is exactly what that Title I funding should be for. All right. Excellent. All, Excellent. Of, all of this. Excellent. Let's talk about universities. Okay. Let's talk about uniforms for a minute. <laughs> because everyone has a different perspective on uniforms. Some traditional schools do not have specific uniforms, others do. It really becomes a community decision as to, number one, whether or not you have students in uniforms, and number two, what they look like and how much variety would there be. What Amy and I have talked about is that really is something that needs to take place over the course of the next school year. As they look at the, would be the 18, 19 school year. And so we're asking that that be given to the community to talk about and decide over time. Um, I don't know of any research that shows that the uniform itself makes me believe on academic achievement. If it's out there, I don't know where it is. But there's a perception and a marketing piece, and there's other things that go into play when you're talking about uniforms. So we were just suggesting that that happens. Later. <laughs> and if I were still a Pima parent, I'd vote for a uniform, personally. <laughs> it's yeah, easier. It's all, easier. Three of, all three of my children <laughs> went through traditional elementary school, so the uniforms were the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's so easy. That's exactly. I'd vote yes in a heartbeat. So easy. Uh, finally, <laughs> the communication process has to be ongoing. One you give approval next Tuesday to move ahead with the reconstruction of Pima, which would be designated then when it opened as a traditional school, we would start that communication process. One of the first things we would do is make sure we put together a, a comprehensive question and answer document and we would start collecting issues that come up from teachers, questions from parents, and we would try to answer and make that available to anyone that wants to know about it. Also through parent meetings, there can be some discussion times, there can be some question and answer times about traditional school. I want to make sure that the teachers fully understand the process this spring, because we may want to start some of the training this coming summer and as school starts in the fall. So that understanding on the part of the teachers needs to happen right away. Um, again, the parent training on following and facts and traditional school philosophy and expectations throughout the next school year as we prepare to open up. And then again, the uniform discussion with that community um, again over the course of the next school year. The really nice thing we have here is the gift of time mm -hmm. to do this right and make it happen the right way. So Amy and I'd be happy to answer any other questions I have. Board Member Kirby. Okay, so I know you said this, but remind me again, Saxon Spalding curriculum goes through fifth grade or sixth grade? It's designed to go through sixth grade. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Board Member Beckham? Would the actual building be built any differently because of the traditional model? Not that I'm. Equal to the rebuild of the other elementary school, taking into consideration. Well, the only thing you might want to think about is if you expect an increase in enrollment, you can make it a little bigger than what mm -hmm. they do right now. That would be the only consideration. I'm sorry, I have another question. I'm sorry. I'm, um, so if Saxon Spalding is designed to go through sixth grade, I guess more of a Saxon question. And we only have Pima go through fifth grade, so they have Saxon through fifth grade. Have we studied what math those kids will then get at Mojave in sixth grade, and will that keep them on the trajectory, or is it going to create a gap of some sort? Right. Um, every traditional line from is an elementary Element. Other than Cheyenne, Cheyenne is the only traditional school that I've ever been associated with in five districts that went beyond sixth grade. Um, Somewhere about the five. Most of my familiarity is with K six. Okay. Elementary school. 
Um, what would happen at the beginning, they would move into a six, whatever the district sixth grade math curriculum is. And I, I don't think this is, I don't think it's a problem. Eventually, the goal would be to move them into a pre algebra sixth grade course once we get those elementary students there. So then, what happens if we make it a K six? What math do they go into in seventh grade? I, I guess, how do we lessen it's, the... It's, it's, the, it's the same answer to your question. Initially, they would be going into what is the seventh grade math for most students. So, now, some would be ready for pre-algebra, uh, depending on the student. Eventually, oh, we, have, okay. we want all of them to be able to move into a higher level math as seventh graders. But that's going to take a few years to get and, and so after that, where the, the few years have passed, and we've gotten the traction that we're looking for, if we had K six at Pima, pre-algebra could be sixth grade. Pre-algebra, right? That's a K five at Pima. If it were K six, pre-algebra would be sixth grade for many kids eventually. At a Pima traditional, not sixth grade Saxon. I would. Now, if they're ready for pre algebra, no. teach them pre algebra. Let's do it. Oh, I thought. Oh, okay. That's okay. I didn't miss that. I thought Saxon went through sixth grade. It's it published. <laughs> I was right. Okay. Board member Becca. Board member Kirby is, is, is right because this happened to our children at mm -hmm. Storm We were a grade ahead in our math. And when we went on to Cocoa Pop, that became one of the problems and why we had the exit. Because they were not on top of the place in that higher math. That should have never happened. No, I know. But that's the answer that's that's what that I am looking for. There will be, because we will recognize that the, the students coming out of Pima will be a grade ahead. So therefore, there will be curriculum classes for them to go into. <laughs> Once they're ready, they'll be there. And and I think that is important that our parents can see eventually or very, very soon a very clear path of where they go after that K five or that K five. But can I okay, I board member Kirby. Okay. And this is it's really important um, because there is that that's a that was real and it was painful. But I just don't want us to put ourselves into a situation where we have this this group of Pima cohort that goes into Mojave. They're a grade level ahead in ahead in math, and so maybe we do have classes for them. But because it's only one of the three middle school or three elementaries that feed into Mojave. There isn't enough math to actually give them the math level that they're at. Does that yeah, make sense? That's actually the joy of going into Mojave is that there is the math. It's there. But if the other elementary schools are not a grade ahead, it won't be there. Okay. Not the last year. But what about eighth grade? What about those teams? They keep going at grade. Like they do now. Once you have enough, you offer it at the middle school. Is one el is one cohort of an elementary school enough? By the time well, so it's fine when they get their sixth grade. It's fine in seventh grade. It's when it's eighth grade, and they're a grade level ahead, and the rest yeah. and the rest of them are not. What do we do? Well, if you're at Cocoa Pie, you get you get bus to Chaparral. So if you're at Mojave, you get bus to Storm. You get bus to the world. And yeah, remember there are there are and they're going to be students. Ahead, at front, coming from Kiva yeah. or coming from Pueblo. Or, I mean, because you just have those kids that get it more. You have those kids that are, are gifted, so they will join together. James, yeah, it's a bit hot in here. Is the AC shut off? <laughs> oh. Thank you. I, I'm sorry for belaboring this, but I just want to make sure. I yeah, I'm sorry. yeah, which is true. No, no, that's that is. That's my board member Kravitz. I agree with you that we really want to make sure there is a place for these students to go that keeps it going, yeah. that keeps that academic that achievement going, that focus going. I think that's important. Okay. 
Okay. Um, anything else after the uniform? I'm, you already have the communication. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, well, at the, maybe before we sit down, so this is uh, slated to be an agenda item, I mean, sorry, an action item on Tuesday night. Yes, action. An action item. Um, just want to be clear. <laughs> that for our board 